What's up, everybody? Hold on a second. We don't start the... <laughs> already starting on the back foot here as we start as we come to you live here with another episode of the outlaw nation show thank you all so much for joining me here tonight it is a little bit eight minutes past uh, when i was supposed to start at five i apologize we got held up out in san diego running back from some errands uh and i had to adjust some lights and all of that so it just put me behind a little bit so i apologize thank you all so much for joining me here live to do this uh, tonight for those of you who have who are just like schedule this all on their schedule all the time. It is the Outlaw Nation show, but tonight a very special Outlaw Nation show. I am going to be watching the 200th episode documentary from the Cinephiles. You know, it's the podcast I co-host with Steve Morris. He, we've been working on this thing, or really him has been working on this thing for months, and uh, you know, it finally dropped over the weekend and i thought to myself like what's a great way to like maximize the exposure for this documentary and kind of uh, you know give something back to the outlaw nation fans and outlaw nation viewers like yourselves a lot of you cross over and watch the cinephiles or listen to the cinephiles of those of you who don't here's an explanation to you every week or for you rather every week we break down a classic film a great film a good film or a film we just love and lately it's been over two or three parts that we've been breaking it down and we go scene by scene through every one of these films talking about the acting talking about the production talking about the pre-production talking about the technical aspects of the movie what lenses were used what the director might have been thinking uh depending on if there is a commentary track with that director steve meticulously reads researches all that stuff so that we can uh, be able to present the show to you. I watch the movie, do a little bit of research myself, slide in, and then we have a great back and forth through those uh, through those episodes talking about uh, great, all these great films. So look, we've had a number of incredible guests, Michael Vogel, Scott Mance, uh, 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 my, our friends Dave Rapp, Stephen Jones, Shannon McClung has come on a few times. We've had so many incredible guests that have come on to the show, you know, Perry Nemiroff with Jurassic Park. Uh, we've had so many incredible incredible guests through the years and some of them were very gracious to be a part of this documentary i'm very honored to be part of the cinephiles it's been it was something that you know we kind of came up with on the fly i guess we'll talk it'll that'll be revealed all during the documentary so this is a special uh episode of the outlaw nation show we're gonna watch the documentary i'm watching it for the first time i'll share my screen so you can watch it with me and i'll share my audio uh, and we'll watch it together. And then afterwards, Steve Morris will be coming in uh, to join us for some uh, Q&A about the movie. Uh, some questions I might ask him, some questions you might ask him. So as we're watching this thing, you know, kind of keep your questions in mind. Write them down if you want or send them in early on the, the Streamlabs or the Super Chat. Feel free. You know, the Streamlabs address is right there, right there. Streamlabs.com slash John Roca says, oh, I'm a bit. I'm a bit bright, ain't I? Hold on a second. Let me, let me turn that down a little bit. Sorry about that. The hair's getting wild, too. It's been a wild day, ladies and gentlemen, a wild effing day. Uh, so anyway, yeah, so you can send in your stream labs, send in your super chats. I'll have them saved, and then we're ready for the Q&A. You all will get to uh, get your answer, your questions answered first. Also, Sean Barreto, who is my producer, will be putting the link in the chat. And of course, the people who are $10 and above patrons of the Outlaw Nation, they will get to come in first and ask any questions they might ask. And there's a lot of you who are massive fans of the Cinephiles, and I appreciate you. And thank you, uh, who are my patrons as well on the Outlaw Nation. And then after that, we'll you know open it up to whoever might be in the chat wanting to come in. Now, I'm going to send the link also to some other people who are part of this documentary. Maybe Mance, if he's got a few minutes, will stop by. Maybe Vogel or other or Sh uh, Shannon. Maybe not Shannon, certainly with what he's dealing with, but maybe there are other people involved in this that will have them stop by for just just a few minutes and hang out with us and talk about their experiences being on the show. I mean, we've had a who's who of guests, right? Matt Nost has been on the show. Dan Pinotion has been on the show, who's a great artist, a comic book artist as well. We've had a 
who's who of people who've been involved in the show. And it's been a pleasure to be a part of it. And I can't wait uh, to get into it and uh, talk about it with you all. Uh, how are you all doing? I mean, are you all hanging out? I mean, the COVID situation's gotten pretty hairy here in, in California. One of the reasons we were late is because we were driving around trying to find a place where we could, uh, you know, set up our computers and work a little bit because we had some work being done in the house. Uh, and uh, we just couldn't find a place. We just couldn't find a place. We drove around to a multiple cities around the area. Just couldn't find a place. And by the time we got out, we got stuck or we got too far out. We got stuck in a little bit of traffic heading back. So that's the situation. How are y'all dealing with this stuff? It's madness. We got HBO Max getting into it with Christopher Nolan. We got all this uh, stuff going down with the Alfred Molina coming back for Spider-Man 3. We got so much happening in the world of entertainment as well. So all of it just hanging around there. Are you guys doing okay? Are you all doing okay uh, as you check in with me tonight on this live show? I appreciate it. Don't forget to hit a hit that like button as well. Hit that thumbs up button on this show. Give it some love. And later, for those of you who are watching later, leave a comment uh, on the show as well. And don't forget, at 8.30 p.m., I will be on Cinema Bias uh, with uh, live with uh, uh, Video Drew and with Alex Shawshank, my co-host on Mornings with the Outlaw every Friday. And we're going to talk about planes, trains, and automobiles. So uh, Alex mentioned it on Friday, and I said I'd love to be on the show. And Video Drew and Alex were very gracious to ask me to come back and be a part of the show. So that's going to be at 8.30 uh, p.m. tonight live. So, But this is about uh, the Outlaw Nation. This is about the cinephiles. Uh, and I'm excited to get into this documentary. Just a little bit of background for you all, kind of like a mini Cinephiles episode. Just a little ba bit of background for you all. Steve and I, you know, we've been doing this for a number of years. But we were friends for a number of years, way before we started the show. Uh, and uh, it's been something that, you know, has grown and not without its growing pains, for sure. Like anything in life, you kind of have to work stuff out and figure out how you work well together. We had to kind of figure, you know, there was a time about a year in, a year and a half in, where I really almost walked away from the show because there was just too many demands and we were kind of just cross, I don't know, is it you, like uh, we were missing signals. We were, we, we were missing signals on each other about what was going on in our world. So that, but we had a really good, strong, hard conversation and kind of ironed out all the situation and the issues there. We've been golden ever since. So that's kind of how we approach things now. You know, if there's any issues or any concerns about timing or what have you, or any discussions would both get into it. And that's invaluable, certainly, uh, to have a conversation that's invaluable. I've done the same thing with uh, Matt Nost and I on the top 10. We sit around, we just have the conversations as well whenever there's any kind of issues going on. But for the most part, it's a it's a joy and it's a it's a fun thing to do. And I love movies so much. It's great. Like when I'll talk about the entertainment news is fine, speculating about all this, pontificating about entertainment news is all great. But what really matters to me is getting to talk about movies and sitting down with Steve Morris every week, who is a filmmaker and a writer uh, and, a, and a, a, a producer, uh, to sit down and both of us just talk about a movie uh, and uh, sometimes ha you know have a great time uh, being on the same page and sometimes hashing out different opinions about characters or about uh, um, motivation or about uh, influences uh, or about construction of the film. All of it is fantastic. And I've learned so much doing it with Steve, and uh, I hope um, he has learned uh, just as much doing it with me. But it's been a blast, and the fans have been incredible who've uh, listened to the episodes. And, uh, you know, we just did, we're in the middle of doing a two part episode with the writer of Blow, with the writer of American History X, and he's got a new film out with Stephen Dorff. We're right in the middle of doing Mississippi Burning with him. Uh, so, hope, slowly but surely, you know, publicists are reaching out to us to pitch us their clients to promote their movies, but also to come on and do the cinephiles with us. So hopefully more and more uh, we'll get uh, producers, writers, directors, actors who want to be uh, a part of the cinephiles or be a guest on the cinephiles to talk about another film. And remember, we had Joe Mantegna on the show as well, talking about the adventures of Robin Hood. Uh, and he's uh, we've uh, kind of hinted around a, at a couple of his friends that he's mentioned would be interested in coming on the show. We'll see. Everything in due time. Uh, and it's hard to believe it's been such a long time that we started this thing. It's been it's incredible to think about how many years ago we started this thing from a casual conversation at a dinner party uh, and what it has led to in terms of the show. I'm not trying to overblow the show. You know, it's not make, you know, it's not getting 100,000, 500,000 views uh, a week. But for, you know, starting out from scratch, it's it's been built. It's it's built up a very fervid and strong fan base 
who enjoy what we do here on the show. Uh, all right. So I wanted to kind of kibitz a little bit, or is it kibitz? I don't know. Kibitz? I think it's kibitz. Spritz is the other thing, right? I wanted to kibitz a little bit uh, with you all uh, before we uh, get into it. Oh, yeah. I should put the link up for people who want to maybe. I'm going to share the screen, just letting you know I'm going to share the screen. But if you want to watch it on your own, I can. Uh, here is, I'll put the link up to the documentary uh, here. Uh, link is here. Um, and like I said, if you want to send your stream labs or super chats while the documentary is going on, feel free. I will have them set up and be the first things we answer uh, as we finish the documentary and as Steve comes on to the show. And there is a possibility. Um, I might just do a Q&A for a few minutes before Steve comes on to the show. Uh, but uh, And we'll see. We'll see if anybody else wants to show up and hang out with us as well. I'll put the call out for sure. Uh, all right. There it is. All right. I'm up and available. I'm up and available for you guys. Cool. Perfect. All right. Let's let's uh, let's see. Where are we at right now? 519. So my time. Uh, uh, if I get flagged, I get flagged. I mean, why weren't we flagged? We're monetized over on on the cinephiles youtube channel so if we weren't flagged there I, I doubt we get flagged here so uh that's just my guess what do you think sean you think we'll get flagged all right i don't think so either uh all right without further i mean this is an hour and tw i think it's an hour and 12 minutes is that correct an hour and 11 minutes an hour and 11 minute documentary Oh, we'll get into it now and uh we'll watch it together um all right or if you want to watch along with me We'll do the three, two, one situation. And let me see, Sean, if I remember how to share my screen. Let me see. Uh, uh, share audio. Share audio. There it is. Share screen. Okay. Okay. Let's see here. We're good to go. We're good to go so far. You know what? Let me eliminate every other window so I don't see anything else but the damn show. Uh, all right. All right, and the and, and the dashboard, of course. Remember, Streamlab super chats. Um, all right, here we go. There it is. Uh, if I make it big, what do I get out? Of it? There we go. Um, okay. All right. Are you guys ready for this? Oh, he's just poking the bear. That's great. All right, let's do this. Uh, thank you for subscribing, level two. I appreciate it. Yeah, if you want to subscribe while you're watching the channel right now, please feel free to subscribe down below. Sean, if I go full screen on this, will will it kind of cloud me over? Like, will I not be able to see myself? Um, uh, what do you think? What do you no, think? you'll be fine. You'll be fine. I'm full screen while I'm watching it. Is this? Yeah, what go look ahead. Like? Go ahead. You'll be fine. Okay. Have faith. All right. All right, here we go. Hide the porn rocket. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, here we go. And ready? If you're going to watch with me, ready? Three, two, one. Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles. My name is Steve Morris. I am a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, <laughs> California. Hey, hello everyone. My name is John Roca. I'm a writer, producer, and host here on the Outlaw Nation and co-host of The Cinephiles and pushover guy and excited uh, to get into our 200th episode, Steve. My God, I did not know or did not think we were going to get here ever. And uh, it's been amazing to be here now at the 200th episode. Well, and we're celebrating this 200th episode by doing something we have never done before, which Damn. is the Cinephiles is on camera. So if you are listening to us in our regular right. audio feed on the podcast, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We hope you enjoy it. But you can actually watch this video and see the faces of not only John and I, but all of our favorite guests. And we're even going to be visited by some of our most important fans and supporters of the cinephiles on Patreon. Because yeah. without you all who are the fans, there's no way the show gets to 200 episodes. So thank you. And it'll be exciting for you all to revisit and spend some more time with some of our best guests who've ever been on the show. And to start off, I think we're going to go way back in time to long <laughs> before the beginning of the cinephiles, long before we ever had an idea of doing a podcast and we're going to go to a strange dive sports bar in Hollywood <laughs> called Big Wang. Oh yeah. To find out how the cinephiles came into existence. 
All right, Sean, Sean, are we good? Do are I think good? there's a connection cool. between Big Wangs, the Cinephiles, and even the Geek Buddies. 100%. I don't think there is a Cinephiles without Big Wangs. Big Wangs is, <laughs> is a place uh, here that used to be here in Los Angeles. Um, it's a sports bar. Yeah. Great tater tots. <laughs> like we have this intellectual, deep, complicated show that can't possibly exist without this divey sports bar in the middle of Hollywood. And it's just about two blocks away from uh, Arclight Cinemas and the Cinerama Dome. So it kind of makes it the ideal spot to go for a drink and some boneless spicy chicken wings after a night at the movies. Great chicken wings. As long as we went to Big Wang's, we were always talking about movies. And chugging sure. down a drink, which I kid you not, is called a Wang Banger. <laughs> Go to Big Wang's, do some Wang Bangers, which is the signature shot. A Wang Banger is one of those things where it's a shot glass that you drop into, you know, another drink. Like, I don't know what was in it. It had, like, Southern Comfort and vodka and orange juice and some sort of probably Red Bull, some sort of energy drink. And basically get super drunk, have chicken wings, and then yell and argue about movies. <laughs> For the crew of us out here in Los Angeles, and Steve Morris and I being part of this crew, and numerous guests of the cinephiles, it was a place we'd go to after a movie. And there's something that, like, my little gay soul just loved <laughs> about being in the middle of a sports bar where everybody else was watching some kind of sporting event and we were arguing about who would beat someone in a fight, Batman versus Superman, or what they could have done to make The Hangover that much of a better, funnier movie. <laughs> I, I think maybe if we had been able to record some of those conversations, uh, we, we, we could maybe have some great ideas or maybe the ideas could be terrible. Those <laughs> memories are a little fuzzy. And I came to think of this weird sports bar is like a magical place. It was a very special place for our group of friends in that time. And I think we just kind of threw around this idea of, wouldn't it be fun to take this conversation and turn it into a podcast? We came up with an idea for a show called, I don't know, what do you think? You know, John's talked about the origin of the cinephiles a whole bunch of times. And he always brings up this, I don't know, what do you think show with Jonathan Blue. I never liked that idea. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I didn't know that. All right. I'll file that away in my brain as something to remember when Steve gives you that smile, that knowing smile that maybe he doesn't 100% uh, feel the idea you're pitching him. But we eventually <laughs> found our way to the cinephile. So even if he didn't like the idea, it paved the way for an even better idea. Yeah. Look, I am who I am. I am terrible at small talk. I'm not that interested in ephemera. So even though we talked about certain podcast ideas during those great conversations at Big Wang's, to me, it was like, how can we do something that's different and substantial? Yeah, yeah, that's Steve to a T. Everything has to always be substantial and mean so much. And I mean, I just wanted to hang out together and talk about movies. And of course, <laughs> in the end, that's what we eventually got to. And I think uh, it has been substantial ever since. Part yeah, of so the origins above. of the cinephiles, frankly, comes out of my depression. You know, I made this film, The Assistance. I'm super proud of it. It did really well in festivals. And then because of a totally unscrupulous salesperson who just basically lied to us and never tried to sell the film it just died and what was so horrible about it is that it, it's not that it didn't succeed because it's a bad film in my opinion i think it's a good film but we just couldn't get it to the audience and then i made this great white shark film mike hoover has spent much of the last decade filming the great whites and while his intention is to demystify the animal the realities of the entertainment industry have put him in an almost impossible position you see there's only one real way to sell a shark show, teeth. So we had this huge <laughs> sale in Europe. It was seen by millions of people, but I couldn't get it to play in my own country. And I was just really bummed. And I was going like, well, what am I going to do? And I was a huge fan of John in the top 10 show. It was so great that Steve became one of the first fans who were my friends. Not that my other friends weren't supportive, but Steve made time. At a time when I was still building my confidence in what I was doing, it was great to know that a person whose opinion I respect was actually listening and uh, appreciating what we were doing on the show. And let me, let's be real clear. No, I didn't have any followers on Twitter. Nobody <laughs> was interested in coming to hear what Steve Morris had to say, but they were interested in coming to see, hear what the outlaw had to say. And there was no question in my mind that I was going to use my good friend John's popularity to help launch the show. Now, that doesn't mean I did, did it 
just for that reason, I knew he was good. I had listened to him many, many times on Top Ten Show. And of course, I'd had all these great conversations with him at Big Wangs and other places talking about film. And for me, it was so different than everything else I've been doing. Because I was doing these recap shows and I was doing you know shows about movies. The Top Ten Show was about movies, but counting them down. And I think the very first choice that was really important was to make sure that the movies had stood the test of time which became our 10 year rule. This was a chance to really sit down with one movie and dissect it and dive into it and talk about the themes and everything else. And that satisfied me as a student of film, as a lover of film. I felt like this show uh, could be different. Mm -hmm. And it eventually it did become completely different from anything else I was doing. Uh, and I've always cherished that. The evolution of the cinephiles is really, really clear. Partially it's because I, you know, I spent so much time editing the shows and I know when I made changes. You know, it's funny, the first few episodes of the Cinephiles, if people go back and listen to them, they're an hour long, <laughs> an hour and a half, just conversations about the movie. And in my opinion, our first good episode is Amadeus. Yeah, Amadeus was the one. Amadeus, uh, for whatever reason, that's the one that clicked something clicked when we did Amadeus and it was where we figured out so that we true. could talk so more true. deeply about film. And I remember that was the episode where I saw for the first time what the show had the possibility to be. When I was editing Amadeus, I kept hearing that opening classical Mozart music. <laughs> We have our kind of fun cinephiles music, and that's how we opened every show. And Amadeus, Love I was like, song. I can't open the show with that music. I have to open it with Mozart. I remember the first time I put Amadeus on in the car, the, our, our episode, and I heard that opening cl clip of the song. And I immediately lost my mind in that moment because I thought it was so brilliant to do that. And it immediately separated this show from anything I was doing at the time or would do later. And ever since... He started every show with either a, a clip from a scene in the movie or a song or something from the score or the soundtrack that immediately puts you in the vibe of the film. And we've got you at that point, and you're with us on this ride in the cinephiles. I started to hear, rather than hearing me say a line or John say a line, I was like, well, if we're talking about this thing, I want to hear the line. If we say this person's performance is great, well, I want to hear the great performance. And music finished as no music is ever finished. Please one note. And there would be and that would be the punishment. This place one phrase and the structure would fall. That movie. If we say this music cue in a film is really powerful, well, I wanted to hear the music cue. There is a string quartet that's playing at the party. Yeah. And they're playing all sorts of classical music. When Hans is coming up the elevator and we come first to the party and they enter, yeah. what piece of music are they playing? They're playing Ode to Joy. Wow. When Hans is in the elevator with uh, Takagi and he's yeah. humming, what is he humming? <laughs> Ode to Joy. Humming Ode to Joy. <laughs> the, the next big one, I think, was The Shining. where And that's where John and I, I think, started pushing each other. That was when I first started to understand that I could play within the parameters of the show and start to challenge Steve. And his surprise was great, you know, because you can rarely catch Steve. Uh, uh, you rarely catch him out. And when you can, it's a, it's a fun conversation usually. I want to ask you about The Shining. Do you believe in this kind of thing? Do you think this thing is possible? Obviously, with this ESP, people who are psychics, with that kind of jazz. Do you think this is possible? This communication that between kind of mental jazz. energies without speaking. I did not expect to be answering this question. <laughs> the really good episodes are ones where we have conversations beyond the film. Apocalypse Now was a huge episode because it was such a mess. Mm -hmm. Before then, our episodes were very much jumping around the movie. Like we'd be in this scene, then we'd jump to a scene at the end, then we'd have to later on think of a thing that we hadn't said about the scene earlier, and then we'd jump back. And it was that episode that made me start to go, oh, we should talk about this in some kind of chronological order. Mm -hmm. And I just love reliving the film as you guys discuss it. Uh, it's almost as enjoyable as watching the film itself. That's when the cinephiles really took shape. And it was this, and it was born wow, out of this feeling that 
Um, there was more to talk about. And if we had a regimented approach to the show, then we'd be able to talk about everything we want to talk about with the movie because it would come up organically as these scenes were presented. Hmm. Yeah, West Side Story. That was a great episode. Mm. West Side Story. Yeah. <laughs> and then we did West Side Story. I don't remember what was going on in my life, but like I just wasn't on the ball. That one was an incredible episode to be a part of because we brought in two incredibly yeah. talented and knowledgeable people about music and about musicals like David Cornu and Melina Govich and had them break down the songs and the dances and the choreography mm -hmm. and Howard Meter for a man who loves this movie because it speaks to me as a lover of musicals, but also because you've got Latinos represented in this movie in a powerful way. It was a whole new way to appreciate the film. And again, the episode, which I'm really, I think it's a really good episode, really hard to edit. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started to go, okay, I need to write down every single thing that happens in the movie. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be a mess. West Side Story, it it has brilliant music. That's, it's a brilliant story. It's that's brilliant Milena writing, Govich, it's by brilliant the way. choreography. Together, they all transcend all those individual genres. When Scott Mance came on the Cinephiles to do Wrath of Khan. Oh, shit. I think that is a watershed moment in the show. Guys, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here to talk about the one thing that I love talking about more than anything. Really? And that is you, Roka. What? No, <laughs> you. <laughs> Having Scott Mance take the time and the chance on a fledgling podcast like ours because of our friendship meant so much to me. I felt like these guys were kindred spirits to me. And I my brother, man. could have gone on for five hours instead of three because i loved how committed they were to doing a deep dive into a film scene by scene moment by moment it was no longer a podcast or an episode we became those nerdy kids who are 12 years old in their parents basement just talking about the love of something that they are super deep into hey guys this is Todd from Maine, and I'm here to talk about my favorite episode of The Cinephiles, which is the episode on The Wrath of Khan. I'm super biased because I've loved this movie as long as I can remember, uh, and that's kind of why this episode is so special to me. It feels the most like a conversation that I would have with my dad. That's the gift of Scott Mance. Scott Mance can make you feel like you've been friends with him for 30 years. What I remember when I left was, I really hope they asked me back. <laughs> Star Trek. Star Trek 2. Star Trek 2. The Wrath of Khan. The Wrath of Khan, yeah. which is, as we all know, widely hailed as the greatest Star Trek movie of them all. Absolutely. The Citizen Kane of Star <laughs> Trek movies. Then we did the month of Kane. Maybe one of the greatest months of my life. No lie. First of all, it created this tradition, which is the first month of every new year, we're going to focus on a director and do a deep dive into their work. I love Orson Welles so much and being able to share it with Steve and talk about it with Steve, who's also a massive Orson Welles fan, was uh, so uh, satisfying. And uh, it's like satisfying a thirst. It's the first time we split a movie into two parts because I just it wasn't possible to fit it all in one. And we were really scared that the audience would reject that. I had a strange confidence about it that it wouldn't be an issue because I think once you do something really well, people will come back for it and you leave them wanting more. That's the number one thing of an entertainer. And one lesson you learn is to always leave them wanting more. And so that's what sort of freed us up to do these bigger episodes was like, oh, people are actually okay with doing three hours of conversation about a two-hour film. Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film. We explore its themes. It's We enter the world. I don't know, man. What? What's going on? I don't know. Do we enter a world of a great film? Yes, we are entering the world of a great film. Is that film. what we're doing today? <laughs> yes, we are doing that today. Do you want to tell them what the movie is? Yes. Welcome, everybody. Uh, well, first, that's Steve Morris. I'm John Roca, and we are talking about Armageddon today. Woo, baby. Armageddon. That was the one. Armageddon is the first movie we did where we felt really differently about it. And it ended up being one of the most fun episodes we ever did. Yeah. Steve was like, well, let's tackle a film that maybe isn't the greatest uh, film or what have you. And I was like, it is the greatest film. And to be really clear, and I hope people know this, I actually like Armageddon. Wait, Steve actually likes Armageddon now? I think there's some issues that need to be discussed about it. 
There are no issues with that film. I don't know what he's talking about. I would say after that, there are two more really transformative films that we did. One was when we did the Civil War documentary. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. That one. Tough. Thanks, Tushka. I appreciate you stopping in, man. That changed our show. That that changed our show. That challenged me in terms of how to put it together and totally changed the way I edited. I have never felt the sense of responsibility to getting an episode right more than I did for the Civil War. Because I love that documentary as much as Steve does. But it's also a very important documentary about our country's history. And I felt it was maybe the most important episode we've done in a very, very long time. I want the show to be an interesting conversation. And what I learned from the Civil War in Apollo 13 was skip the boring parts. Jump ahead to a new cut. Let the cut propel us forward. It'll be the worst disaster NASA's ever experienced. With all due respect, sir, I believe this is going to be our finest hour. For me, sometimes our best episodes are not from the best films. As part of a guilty pleasure series, we did Zorro the Gay Blade. Yeah. Two fruits, one vegetable, and a fruit salad. <laughs> Which is one of John's absolutely favorite <laughs> movies from a certain era in his life. He loves it. I do not. The conversation we had for that episode is one of my favorites. Yeah. That's one of the surprising things about the show. You never know what you're going to discover. Something where you think might be lightweight or might not have too much, uh, I don't know, too much depth to it. All of a sudden, you discover there's a lot more bubbling underneath the surface. That movie led us to get into things that I think we never would have gotten into mm. without that film. Yeah. You know, I take a certain amount of pride that coming out of that episode, Steve was a little worried about doing it. And by the end of it, uh, felt that we had a fantastic episode and great discussions that were born from what is a, you know, a funny, frivolous take on Zorro that walks the line, but in the end, is a positive film. Obviously, you have a well-established Latino identity, <laughs> but I also think that your love for this film shows a deep, deep affection for a certain kind of Catskills Jewish humor. Oh, yes. And I think I might give you the title of Honorary Jew. I, I, I don't know what to say. I am super honored about that. <laughs> and I know a lot of people who watch The Cinephiles, they watch it by looking through the list, picking a film that they love and listening to it. And if you see a film maybe that you not never saw, aren't interested in, you skip it. Some of those might be our best episodes. Yes. Very true. I think one of the things that's great about Cinephiles and one of the things that actually inspired me and John and Shannon to go do Geek Buddies is the ability to bring your friends in and have them weigh in on their opinions. It takes this family of people who all love cinema, and then expands it out to all the other great guests they've had. I know this is gonna sound strange. I think Mike Vogel is the most like me guest we have on the show. As John and Shannon will tell you on the Geek Buddies, I pretty much love listening to myself talk, so <laughs> definitely my favorite episodes of The Cinephiles are the ones where I'm a guest. So and true. You have to hold on because Mike will run away with the show because he has a tendency, I won't say to take over. Don't Maybe don't try to drive every time. You know, same. Go ahead, Steve. What is you were saying, Steve? Maybe take that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, leave it in. You know what? Leave it in. Yeah, leave it in. <laughs> you know what? Leave it in. <laughs> I'll be leaving that in. Uh, it's always a blast to have him on the show. And he loves doing the show, which makes us enjoy doing the show even more. Yeah, I, I've often been asked, you know, did you go to film school? And I said, yeah, I went to film school every weekend. <laughs> but gentlemen, the movie is called Blade Runner. You think the movie's about Harrison Ford? You think the movie is about Deckard? The movie... Blade Runner is about gaff. Listen to this. Okay, hold on. The movie, this is a controversial right, statement. The movie Blade Runner is about Edward James Olmos. What? Gaff is the Blade Runner. The thing about Mance is that he brings such a joy to doing our show that humbles me because Scott is one of the greatest reviewers of films, one of the most knowledgeable and one of the most well-known. And for him to speak honestly and authentically about his experiences with us and how much joy he has uh, in breaking down a film with us, to me, um, um, humbles me because it makes me know that we're doing something really good. The main thing I'm looking for in an entertaining movie is not to think about how they made it. <laughs> 
after their first table read, some assistant had gone up to Eric Stoltz and was saying, hey, this movie is going to be really great. It's going to be really, really funny. And he goes, oh, I don't think this is going to be funny at all. <laughs> oh, this, is, this is tragic. <laughs> He's going to go back to a life that didn't exist. And that was his. That was in his head. Wow. That was his way in. Yeah. The first time Shannon McClung came on the show, I think he was nervous. Yeah. The, Super <laughs> the main feeling I get even now coming on to the cinephiles as a guest is intimidation. <laughs> Shannon's a, a very deft listener. Go, well, Shannon can sit for an <laughs> hour and listen to us talk. And when John and I are talking, I mean, obviously with 200 episodes, we, we can talk a blue streak. And, and this is what happens when we when we talk about movies at bars afterwards. We'll talk about how much we loved it, and then the and then the critical thinking starts. And I will just like I'll just sit there with my mouth open, being like, God, I did not <laughs> I did not think about that at all. And some things I agree with, and some things I don't. And then he'll chime in with something really unique and interesting and uh, brilliant. And we're, we're both just kind of taken aback for a moment because we've been talking for so long. And then in Back to the Future, which, is, by the way, might be the funniest episode yes. of the Files of all time. Maybe. But not as good as Perfect Strangers. No, Perfect Strangers is the best theme. That the, sure. That's the best theme song sure. from the 80s, Absolutely. period. Gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> Standing <laughs> tall on the wings <laughs> of my dreams. <laughs> Rise and fall <laughs> on the wings <laughs> of my dreams. And the best part. Through rain and thunder, wind and haze, I'm bound for better days. And that's what's great about Shannon. Shannon doesn't have the ego that he needs to be involved. He needs to be jumping in at every moment that he can. When Shannon jumps in and commits himself, he is awesome. You know, I went to Ferris Bueller's Day Off and came out of that movie. That's and Dave all of my friends were like, oh, my God, that's you. You're Ferris. <laughs> and I was uh, like, no, no, that's not me. And being like, yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have taken the time to, by yourself, somehow pull, <laughs> yank up a body? Were there ropes? What did he do? Yeah. I don't know what he did. Yeah. He did it with the banners. <laughs> And yet, it's such a great visual, yeah. and you've built up so much credit with me. Yeah. I'm like, yes, okay. Oh. Because this is a man who's been dying of thirst forever, yeah. and he finally yeah. gets to the water. And he's like, <laughs> he I am just, a big drink. I am taking the biggest drink. Something you would never know from listening to Dave rap on the Cinephiles is that he has stage fright. I get very anxious and nervous. I have uh, uh, stage fright that's uh, been pretty bad ever since I was a little kid. We both respect Dave. Dave's literally a rocket scientist, an incredibly he brilliant is. guy. He's a rocket and scientist. he brings so much intelligence and enthusiasm to every episode we do. Oh, and Dave good. has such a deference to our show that is so um, sweet. I can remember seeing an ad for Star Wars on TV That's where David Luke Jones. Skywalker an animator. Is, is wrestling with a sand person. And I remember in my tiny child brain, I remember I think I thought he was wrestling with the Statue of Liberty. And it reminded me of the end of Planet of the Apes, which I think I'd seen on TV at that point. And then my brain is just like, is all science fiction somehow related to the Statue of Liberty? All of George Miller's films, but particularly The Road Warrior, it is such an example of the rule of thirds. So often there are two things going on in the frame. You know, and usually someone's in the foreground and someone's in the background, but because of the lens he's using, they're both in focus. It's almost like he's telling the story left to right. So I've been having conversations about movies with Steve Jones since high school. I am truly a geek. Basically, we consider our friendship to just be a one long 30-year conversation. I think being a, a geek is unabashedly loving something to the degree that you don't care how it makes you look. If I love a friend, I'm, I love them unabashedly and unreservedly. If I love a person, it's the same way. My children, like... I don't really believe in trying to look cool when it comes to the things that I love. And so having him come on the cinephiles to me is just like an extension of what we've been doing <laughs> since we were kids. Like, hello, oh, Twister. Yeah, Sasha what Pearl. What from Twister? Don't chase a tornado. And that can be a metaphorical tornado. That can be an actual tornado. Like these are things that you have to learn. Every night before we went to bed, he had to talk to me and then be like, I love you. I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, but nothing friend zoned so hard. Oh, and I'm see. a girl. Yeah. I have Willy Wonka's golden ticket to the fuck factory <laughs> of vagina. And I <laughs> could Please, not. Someone Hold make on. that a shirt. I think Sasha Pearl Raver is one of um, the best 
guests we've had on the show. I think it's always <laughs> just been something where perhaps my passion was a little too unbridled. And all the walls are down and we're talking about the nuttiest, craziest things. That's what's so great about the cinephiles is that we can have a great conversation about complicated issues based on what's happening in the film. And Sasha was just the best for that. I think we talked about anal sex with Sasha Pearl Raver. Mm. So whoever thought we'd talk about that on a episode where we break down a film. <laughs> I am never, I'm never getting on this show. I'm just going to have to look at it from the back. That's fine. I'll look at it from the back row. I'll just be a fan. Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where we have survived stomach viruses, sick kids, difficult travel plans, stressful holiday parties, and, New Year's Eve. And <laughs> oh my God. Nobody survived. <laughs> oh, Jesus. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Michael Ross. You, you uh, missed one thing in my in my credits. Super, uh, super fan of the cinephiles. He is calmly trying to have a conversation with us as we're careening to our deaths, uh, Thelma and Louise style, and I love it. Here, you, here we go. <laughs> oh. It's the most challenging. It is the most funny. The most unpredictable. Oh, no, no, no. It was a joke. No, it was a joke. Totally a joke. I am never more alive doing a cinephile show than I am with Mike Ross because I have no idea what he's going to so say, true. what to expect. So I true. sit you in that clockwork orange chair, and I'm just like, <laughs> we did uh, Christmas Vacation. <laughs> uh, that show felt completely out of control. Yeah. Oh no, I'm not going to. Then tell I you what listen he said. to the show. <laughs> that show is so funny. Yeah. How really? I'm like, oh, oh maybe I am a cinephile. That's the thing as an artist that uh, if you can make one person feel anything close to that, I mean, you got to feel like you're doing something important. Steve's wife. I think this is all part of that same problem that we're dealing with. You know, the media taking place of journalism, you know, of entertainment taking the place of news, sensationalism taking the place of truth. I try to be objective as an editor and to really evaluate things for their quality and... I really think Karen was a great guest. I enjoyed having Karen on the show. Well, a because she's the, you know she's the other half of Steve Morris. And those of you who listen to the show know that my conversations with Karen definitely inform what I say on the Cinephiles. Her opinion matters to me. I think Karen is an, an essential part of the Cinephiles in a in a phantom way. Quite frankly, she puts up with the bullshit of the Cinephiles in a way that is very generous and is not always very easy. So thank you, Karen. And look, everyone's got that one movie that when they saw it, whether in a theater or at home, that one movie that got inside them and changed them and started them down that path of becoming a cinephile. My dad being a military man, he's not the most, um, he's not a cold guy, but he's not a, he's not a sharer. <laughs> we lived on the base. My father was in the Navy. So on all the bases, there's a little base, you know, N Navy base theater. And I'd never been to the Navy theater. And I remember walking up the steps and thinking, where are we? And as we walked in, it was at, right at the beginning of the Battle of Hoth. My dad took me and a friend of mine to go see the first Naked Gun. <laughs> just going in and just being surrounded for like my, you know, five, six year old eyes. I was just enthralled. It was like, just, I remember laughing. I like, remember becoming an adult in cinema. And so suddenly I'm in the Battle of Hoth and I'm with my dad. Naked Gun in particular was kind of like the first, like with my dad was like this. He trusts me, like he trusts me. I became a man, I understand this, you know? Not only was I getting to see this movie that I had that I had loved, but I was doing it with the most important guy in my life. That's that was that's a that's a pretty good memory for me. E.T. in San Francisco. I saw that movie eight and a half times in the theater. That was probably the first time I ever experienced a movie as an event. Seeing a film that had characters that were about my age that I felt like reflected like this ultimate version of what my life could be if my best friend came down from space and being able to connect so deeply with every single character on screen. And that was really, I feel like the first moment where everything changed. One of the first movies that I remember loving was a movie that made me feel 
like there was more going on, that there could be more. And it's as dorky as it is, it's the Wizard of Oz. My parents took me to movies all the time, but I think the the first time that my mind was truly blown, which was not great for my dad, was the first time that I saw Labyrinth on the big screen. And it's weird because it's a movie I've never seen in the theater. I was obsessed with that movie. The change from black and white to color and seeing the change from reality to fantasy. Jim Henson creature effects, my first exposure to David Bowie and the MC Escher type look of everything. It hit all my buttons in exactly the right spot. As a kid just, you know, didn't know that the stuff I have blurry visions of in my head and my imagination could be crisp and clear and amazing. And it wasn't great for my dad because I think I made him take me to see that movie nine times in the movie theater. Mm. Poor dad. <laughs> for almost everyone of my generation, of course, there's Star Wars. I know a lot of people from my generation will say the obvious answer is, oh my God, I couldn't wait to see Star Wars. The visual experience of seeing <laughs> Star Wars, I think probably is a lot of what led me into wanting to work in a visual medium and become, you know, a comic book artist and a storyboard artist. And then when you saw the Star Destroyer fly over, it was like, oh my God. And then from the top of the screen, we have Leia's little ship, you know, pew, 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 and the lasers coming in. That wasn't my first mind blowing experience. My first <laughs> look at that little man experience going to a movie <laughs> took place a year earlier when I saw the Dino D. Laurentiis production <laughs> of. King Kong. <laughs> King Kong with Jeff Bridges introducing Jessica Lang and Charles Grodin as an oil tycoon. And when you see King Kong climb to the top of what was then the brand new World Trade Center, and when he's getting shot at by those helicopters, I, I got so upset. I, I felt so bad for Kong. That was an absolutely mind-blowing moment that, as you can tell, ladies and gentlemen, I still remember like it was yesterday. In 1976, I'm eight years old, and we go to downtown Tiburon to the Tiburon Playhouse, which is a tiny little movie theater, and the movie we watched is Rocky. When he says, yo, Adrian in the ring, as an eight-year-old kid, I was crying. You know, it's like, I, I always knew I wanted to watch stuff, but they were all entertainments. And then going like, oh, art can tap into this emotional place in my body. That's completely different. I think I was seven years old. And the oh movie God. was oh my Pinocchio. God. I remember just the imagery and the, the donkey scene, the whale, everything about the animation, Jiminy Cricket, falling in love with Jiminy Cricket, the songs. And I remember just kind of like as a zombie walking up to my bedroom uh, and just sitting there and just thinking about the whole movie and just wondering about the power of film. I don't think I knew I was different. It's sometimes hard to become aware of where you are because that's just where you are. I think that I knew movies were more important than most of the people in my old life really, really early on. Watching films was affecting me emotionally in a way that it wasn't seeming to uh, affect my friends. Everybody loved Star Wars. Everybody loved Indiana Jones. But being able to discuss it in a certain level of detail mm. that was not widely widely shared. I kind of thought that everybody kind of took in what they were looking at the same. You know, you'd be out on the playground and you'd be on a jungle gym and that would be the Millennium Falcon. And I remember correcting someone because they were on the wrong side of the jungle gym to be in the cockpit. It's like, <laughs> no, 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 that's the, you gotta be on the other, you gotta be on the other side, Brian. I, I grew up in Philadelphia, <laughs> Northeast Philadelphia. And all, awesome. all my friends were, were big, big, huge sports fans. We all played street hockey. We played two touch football and just full disclosure. I was horrible at all of it. <laughs> and that's also the time when I started to obsessively read and reread comic books and fantasy novels and watch movies over and over again because, you know, I didn't really have any friends. And I think the realization for me that I had a relationship <laughs> with cinema that transcended everything in my life came in 1982, specifically in June of 1982. I stayed home from school because I was sick. 
And uh, my mother had gone to Video World. I had asked for The Great White Hope. I asked for Citizen Kane. And that's when I first discovered the power of the movie of Citizen Kane. There was no better month in the history of movies than June of 1982. Now, I say that because there were so many great movies that I wanted to see. And my friends could not be bothered. And with my group of friends, I tried to talk about these movies. And no one had heard of a couple of those films. I would get so passionate about something like Pulp Fiction that I would start fights with my friends. My friends were like, it's just a movie. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's not just a movie. It's so much more than just a movie. That period of time was when I rode my bike to see movies like Poltergeist, Star Trek II, E.T., Blade Runner, The Thing. So I didn't know that rereading the same book 10 Thank times was fan. weird. I didn't know that watching a movie over and over again was weird. And I knew I had to find my crew, and eventually I did. And, and then when I finally started to gain some social skills over a decade or so, it's very hard for me, um, the people that I became friends with were actually people that were into that kind of thing. It started to attract friends to me that had at least similar reactions to film, that it wasn't just something to do on a Saturday afternoon. That was the first time where it was like, oh, these are my people. We'd go to movies, and then after the movie, we'd go to Bob's Big Boy because they had the breakfast buffet all night. And sitting around watching movies for seven or eight hours wasn't considered a waste of time. It was considered being studious. That's when I realized I was different than everyone else, all the cool kids and the jocks and all that. I couldn't talk movies with them but I could with my nerdy movie friends. And uh, it was it was such a great thing to find your tribe. And that was when I started to think, you know, maybe it's Truth. okay if I don't play these sports games with my friends because I'm a, I'm a lot happier going to the movies. I'm a lot happier sitting, yeah. waiting for the movie to start. I didn't care what the show was. I just wanted to be in that theater when the lights went down and the music started. And I was like, this is my jam. This is my jam. Movies really are kind of my church. They're my comfort. My church, my synagogue, my temple was the movie theater. And the idea that you're in a theater with 350, 450 other people, but you are having a personal moment with this thing that's 25 feet wide on the screen is crazy. I can't imagine a world without film. I can't imagine mm. wanting to live in that world. It well, really wasn't so until poignant. probably in my 20s wow. that I went... Oh, the way I think about these things and the way I break them down, and I, that's maybe the big part, is that part of what I was doing that I didn't understand was that I was trying to figure out how it works. When we got out of Jurassic Park, The Lost World, like most people <laughs> watching Lost World, a little bit disappointed. And like my best friend from high school was like, I didn't like that movie. It was boring. And my sister was like, it was fine. And I was like, I really liked it. I thought it started strong, but at the in the middle of the movie, they did this thing with the character and it wasn't that great. But then you get to where the truck kind of goes over the edge and Julianne Moore falls on the glass. And it's like, oh my God, this is what I've been waiting for. This is like classic Spielberg. This is what I wanted. But I just felt like you didn't really care about the characters. And then by the time you get to the middle of the movie, there's this plot thread that doesn't come together and this plot thread that doesn't come together. And I think I have some solutions. If you had done this and you had done this, it would have been a lot better. <laughs> I think what made me realize that I was different was that all felt just normal, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it was just like, this is what I want to do. And I had no idea what that meant that young. And my dad kind of looked at me afterwards. We got home. He goes, you know, you should probably do this for a living because not everybody watches a movie that way. And I was like, what are you talking about? It was obvious. Yeah. When I saw Star Wars, the special edition in the movie theaters, It'd probably be 1995's Toy Story. My first mind-blowing experience in the movie theater was probably Mad Max Fury Road. 2001 A Space Odyssey, a couple of years ago. Uh, and I can remember sitting on the couch with my siblings around and my father, and we were watching Back to the Future, all huddled around this little set. I was totally taken back by the score and the sound and just how scary the film is. My most mind-blowing experience was the full Monty, 97. I was in a British cinema and we all stood up and applauded at the end. No one shows emotion in British cinema <laughs> apart from them. I couldn't believe what I just saw on the screen that I just wanted to watch it over and over and over again. I've uh, seen Optimus Prime and the rest of the Autobots in Transformers. My imagination just exploded. Mr. Outlaw, John Roca, I'm on your side on that one. Yeah, bro. First time Feel going it. to the movies by myself, 
I went to see this thing. When I was 13 years old, and uh, Steve, you might know this place, it's the Sin Arts Dome Theater in Pleasant Hill, California. And uh, I remember seeing Jurassic Park opening day there. I remember when the uh, DeLorean took off at the end and flew around and turned back and flew towards the camera. It absolutely blew my mind. And that final sting, it just completely blew my mind. I just love the movies. I am managing a bookstore. I am in the Army Reserves. I am trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. I know I want to be an actor. I know I want to study film, but I don't know where I, I don't know where I fit. And then I went to see Fincher Seven. And I remember that I could not catch my breath, that I left the theater and I was walking around the mall once again, like a zombie in a daze, and I could not catch my breath. And I just remember walking around, like, I have to do this, even if it kills me and I end up homeless or whatever. I can't keep living this life that I'm living now of possibly doing it. I have to live this life where I do do it. That was the movie that absolutely changed me and made me realize I had to go do it. I had to do this. You know. Pulp Fiction, it was this. It was drawing the rectangle <laughs> and the rectangle coming up on screen. And it was nice. a different kind of visual language than anybody else had ever done. And suddenly I was like, movies are so much more. Going to see Fight Club was such a transformative experience because it's levels of reality and the way it plays with the filmmaking convention and yet manages to propel you on this incredibly complicated and entertaining story. You are seduced by Tyler Durden and by everything that's happening. And as you're doing that, what Tyler Durden is doing is transforming into something that's really wrong. And so it manages to suck you on board to a thing that actually you really shouldn't like in the long run. And that just, just blew my mind that someone could conceive of that kind of a film. Les Miserables. There is a moment where, spoiler alert, um, Javert <laughs> commits suicide and the bridge flies up behind him. It was so real and it was so beautiful that I just sat there. That was the moment that I actually remember thinking to myself, if I could make one person feel the way that I felt in that moment, that it would all be worth it. The most mind-blowing movie experience for me was at Comic-Con in 2010. <laughs> I wound up getting us advanced screening tickets. It was one of the first times they were showing the movie for Scott Pilgrim. Yep. Oh, oh my God. So the screening of Scott Pilgrim versus the world. That was one of the best moments of my movie-going life. That was a top five, not just a Comic-Con experience, that was a top five movie-going experience. Uh, that screening was absolutely fantastic. It was orgasmic, that screening. Uh, if you weren't there, I feel bad for you because that screening was everything. Jesus Christ, I get it. I, I wasn't there. And I got to hang out with Anna Kendrick at the after party, so not too shabby. Stop rubbing it in, okay? I, they said invite your 10 best friends. <laughs> <laughs> I had to actually go, this is so embarrassing. I had to go look it up, like look it up to see what it actually meant. Cause you know, you're just like, I don't know, is that it? Like I'm sure somebody that likes movies. Maybe it's something deeper than that. What does it mean to be a cinephile? That is a loaded question. To me, being a cinephile has no gender, has no language, has no country. Well, I guess if we just break down the word, it just means a lover of film. Art is subjective. And movies are art, so that makes movies subjective. Yep. I don't think you have to be an expert. I don't think you have to have studied things. And I think everybody comes to movies differently. Most people come into a film and they're going to see a movie or watch a TV show or whatever to be entertained. My entry point into film was entertainment, is I wanted it to be fun. You know, a casual film goer will just watch a film, let the whole thing wash over them, and then decide. I liked it or I didn't like it. I had fun or I didn't have fun. But then there are these small group of weirdos where that's not enough. But I think a cinephile to me is someone who understands the basic foundation of film and how it works and appreciates it and is always in awe of it. It, it, it gives you the chills. It gets under your skin. Yeah. It makes you wide-eyed with joy and intrigue. So many things in my life has changed, but my love for film has really been a constant and it's really only gotten wider and deeper. A cinephile is someone who will dig deeper. You know, to be a cinephile means looking a little bit deeper. 
you know, maybe they get obsessed about how the special effects were made, or maybe they want to look into the background of all the Star Wars characters, or maybe they want to know about the history that connects to the film. It's that desire to go deeper for me that makes a cinephile. And it's something I didn't do until I started listening to this podcast. That desire is what the show is based on. And I think that's what our audience is based on is people who go, all right, I love this movie. Mm. Now I want more. You are not just granted cinephile status because you you like a lot of movies. It's more a matter of, can we have a conversation about the nuance and the complexities and the levels of a film? That's a cinephile to me. What's great about the cinephiles is they've created a safe place, if you will, where you can just come and talk about something that you adore, even if the thing that you love is not perfect and what in life that we love is. You have an experience that transcends what you're seeing on the screen. You love that about the film because you're, it, it, it's showing you something different. And I can take it a different way watching it when I'm 15 and then take it a different way when I'm watching it when I'm 30 yep. and then take it a different percent. way when I'm watching it in my 60s. Whether you be 15 years old or 85 years old, if you can have a conversation about a movie and show me a different way to look at it uh, and challenges me, and nothing excites me more than that. I think those of us that are cinephiles revel in that. What I think it means to be a cinephile is to show love and appreciation for the entire art form and all its variations. You're watching cinema to make yourself understand that movies are a global thing. I have a friend who works in costume design. She produces costume awards. And when she sees a movie, she totally responds to the look. She knows every person who designed every movie. I don't know that, um, but I know story structure uh, and writing a lot better than she does. And I have friends who have an eye for cinematography that I will never have. No matter how much I watch, no matter how much I study, no matter how much I learn, I'm never going to learn enough to be the ultimate cinephile. And I know people who just love going to the movies. They don't necessarily love to critique it the way that I do or that Steve does or that John does, but they just love movies. And I think all of those things count as being a cinephile. A cinephile is somebody who can tell you who they are by the movies that they love. Ah, but surrender yourself that. over to the film. Give yourself over to the film. Let yourself be consumed by the cinematic experience. That's a cinephile. Hi, John and Steve. It's Laura from Sydney here. Hello. Congratulations on your 200th episode. Uh, the Cinephiles was the very first podcast I ever subscribed to, wow. and it still remains my favorite today. Oh, I've told you. this to John and Steve from almost from the beginning that I, I came as a friend, but I stayed as a fan. I've had conversations with a lot of people over the years, <laughs> but I have never, I have never ever had the kind of in-depth conversation about a film like I've had on the cinephiles mm -hmm. like nothing tops the joy and the fun and the knowledge and the discovery the overall experience of doing a conversation about a film doing a deep dive and for however long it takes one of the few podcasts where uh, you discuss a film in more time than it takes to watch the movie. <laughs> to take a film like Star Trek The Motion Picture and divide it into two parts? <laughs> no one else would do that. <laughs> Only the cinephiles would do that. True. Steve and John allow hey. for discussions to go as long as they feel they need to. And look at things in a way where it goes beyond just like the broad strokes of, I liked it, I didn't like it. It's every single beat by beat so that you get more into, I think, what the storyteller's intention was. I feel like I'm having a conversation with Steve and John, uh, which is easy for me to imagine because I have had many conversations <laughs> with them, but also, I'm also learning things. It's a great podcast because you get to really sit there and go through the film and see what works, what doesn't work. And so when you get to those final thoughts, you've gone on the journey with, both Steve and John, which is what I love. And it really makes me appreciate film and storytelling even more. I really like how you guys go deep into the nitty gritty technical aspects of the film. It's fun because even as a guest with two people that you've known for a long time, talking about a movie that you've loved, you still learn a lot and you come away seeing the movie a little bit differently. I love when Steve and John respectfully disagree about something. <laughs> and even though both hosts 
uh, might dig their heels in and they're not going to give an inch of ground. There's an underlying respect uh, that keeps the debate healthy. We were having a conversation about Star Trek The Motion Picture, and I can't remember the specific of it, but here I've seen this movie, Star Trek The Motion Picture, you know, so many times, not as many times as Wrath of Khan, um, but John said something that just made me go, I never thought about that. I forget what it was, but I'm sure he'll remember it. <laughs> and the reason I ask this is because it's very similar to shooting one pilot and shooting a second pilot. And oh, to me, that is Khan, a great point. To me, Khan feels like the second yeah. pilot of the original motion picture. Okay, let me just pause and just say, every once in a while, I earn my money on the fucking Bravo, yeah, Johnny. That's what I thought as I was watching this. I was like, this feels like a second. It's pilot. a do over. It's a do over. That is a brilliant, no, a brilliant analogy. That is so great, and it never occurred to me. And you, th that is really good. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. wow, fascinating, wow. great, great analogy. Yeah. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm gonna leave now. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly when I think of episodes that are my favorite, they're my favorite because I wish I was on them. <laughs> now you've asked what my favorite episode is, and that's like asking me what my favorite movie is. It's a really complicated question. John and Steve have covered the greats. They covered the classics. They've covered the cults. I love them all, but if I'm going to pick, them, pick one, it's going to be Empire because that's my favorite movie of all time. What's your favorite episode of The Cinephiles? Uh, if I had to guess, I'd say probably The Shining. For me, Chinatown, and for my wife, Abby, the Charlie Chaplin, Modern Times one. I think one of my favorite episodes that I went back just recently and listened to was the Karate Kid, the moment where Mr. Miyagi has, has passed out. After he's put Miyagi to bed and he's seen the Congressional Medal of Honor and all these things, Daniel starts to leave and then turns and bows. It didn't register with me the importance of that, but then hearing Steve talk about it, what a powerful moment that was. One of my favorite episodes is when Eric Rogers was a guest and did Jaws. But my favorite is probably Jaws. And from Steve's, you know, really insight into sharks with his documentaries. And Eric Rogers was just a fantastic guest. There are a lot of people that do what I do, which is watch the movie and then listen to the episode. But there's also a lot of people out there that listen to the episode and watch the movie. Mm -hmm. And there have been times where I've been tempted to watch the movie, listen to the episode, and then watch the movie again <laughs> because you guys bring up things that I don't necessarily notice, even though I'm actually nine times out of 10 watching the movie with the cinephile sitting there with his keyboard typing everything. <laughs> so that would probably be my favorite episode of the cinephiles, although none of them are bad. I mean, you guys are awesome. When you're watching a film like 2001 A Space Odyssey for the 30th time and you're getting something new about it that you didn't see the other 29 times, I think that one of my favorite episodes is definitely uh, Shawshank Redemption. I have the Gladiator episodes and the Ben-Hur episodes. I listened to them while I was at work, working night, uh, night security at a big resort. They also got me through a lot of stuff when I was going through. My favorite episode is the Back to the Future double episode. It's the Proto Geek Buddies episode. <laughs> I love it. I listen to it again and again all the time. Back to the Future. Information I just didn't know about, and that's what I love about the Cinephiles. It's the information you just keep giving us. Thanks very much. You know, the knowledge and the and the research that Steve and John bring to the show, you know, it's, it's really remarkable. And it helped me to appreciate that movie, Shawshank, on a completely different level than what I ever had. But there are a few that really stick out for me. I love the Civil War episodes. Mm -hmm. I really, really loved the uh, Monty Python Holy Grail episode. <laughs> uh, I absolutely loved the Jaws episode, but I think my favourite has to be A League of Their Own with Kate Cannon. Oh, you yeah. know, one of my favourite movies of all time, I think a lot of people will say this, is Citizen Kane. And their, their Cinephiles episode on Citizen Kane was the Citizen Kane <laughs> of Cinephiles podcasts. <laughs> Favorite episodes is tough because honestly, they all, I think they're all good. I do. I never felt that we've done a bad cinephiles episode. You can say in comparison, it's not as good as others for certain episodes. Absolutely. But I don't think I've ever felt walking away from a cinephiles episode um, that we made a bad episode. Thousand percent. Of, yeah. I still believe that. The first time that I came in to do cinephiles, I felt like the kid that didn't fully do his homework. Being on this podcast is fantastic because I get to talk about great movies, but it is also 
nerve wracking beyond belief. John and Steve were like, we want to have you come on. We want to talk about Superman. And I'm like, oh my God, Superman. Like, I love Superman. He's my favorite superhero. I love that movie. I've seen it a thousand <laughs> times. I am in. And I showed up and we sat down and I instantly realized that I was out of my depth. The first time I came in, I was deathly afraid because I know what a great conversationalist Steve is. I know that John it knows so much about movies and is has a very big personality and i wanted to be able to to hold my own and even on days where i'm not feeling it or i'm tired or i had a big night the day before and i'm not feeling my best by the time you get there and sit down you just get swept up in the moment and you get so excited about their excitement that honestly before you know it it's done uh and you're like oh I'm ready. I'm ready to go more. Like I can talk more about this. And they're like, no, no, we got enough. Like that's a really long podcast. And you're like, all right, well, you know, next one, I'm, I'm cool. I'm, I'm available. <laughs> I, if I could have a conversation with John and Steve every week on the Cinephiles, I would, I would make the time to do it. When, when Steve and John had first started the Cinephiles, and they discussed, hey, we'd love to maybe have you on. Do you think? Can you think of any movies you might want to have on? I think I sent Steve a list of like probably a hundred films. <laughs> I thought I was being helpful, and then I don't. I think Steve was kind of like, "Could you, could you maybe narrow it down a little bit?" <laughs> wow, the next movie, the next movie. I should have, I should have had that prepared. as a feeling you were going to ask. You know, a movie I fucking love that I don't know if you guys have done is Dangerous Liaisons. Mm. Much to John's chagrin, I would like to do The Goonies. <laughs> I'm telling you, no. you guys are going to run out of movies, and we're we're going to have to do one that I know Steve will not be able to watch. Like, The Room. I am still 100% committed to getting them to cover both Ewok movies, <laughs> uh, Caravan of Courage, and Battle for Endor. <laughs> we'll see if that actually happens. <laughs> um, um... Dirty, manipulative John Malkovich. I want to see Greg Close getting all kinds of closey. I want baby Uma Thurman all up in it. Uh, <laughs> I think if we could actually get John to sit down and watch it, I think he would actually like it. Because no. as bad as those movies are, they are part of the Star Wars canon. Mm, well, all right. How about a movie that was the Citizen Kane of the 21st century. And yes, I'm talking about The Social Network. Yep. Yep. The Social Network is a movie I absolutely love to pieces and the parallels between The Social Network and Citizen Kane should be obvious, they're not. But when we make them obvious on a future episode of The Cinephiles, it's going to blow a lot of people's minds, and I can't wait to have that conversation with Steve and John. Every time I think about it, I'm just, we've only scratched the surface. Mm. And certainly our fans remind us all the time of movies like, how is it possible that you didn't do this or didn't do that? It's like, you're right. I want to dive back into classic films more deeply. We haven't dug into the noirs, you know, movies like Double Indemnity or Maltese Falcon, yeah. The African Queen with Humphrey Bogart and, and Catherine Hepburn. Bridge on the River Kwai is one of my absolutely favorite films. Bridge on the River Kwai is one that uh, Steve and I have talked about many, many times. Guys and Dolls and My Fair Lady and American in Paris. And some of the Fred Astaire stuff, right? We haven't done uh, uh, Swing Time. We haven't done Top Hat. We've only done really one true silent film, which was The General from Buster Keaton. F.W. Murnau's Last Laugh is one of the most shattering films I've ever seen. I mean, if we want, really want to go super deep, Battleship Potemkin, Ivan the Terrible. We've only done one Billy Wilder. We've mm. never done an Ernst Lubitsch. French cinema, so like 400 Blows, or Italian, like eight and a half. And of course, the big one that is the most requested that I promise we haven't forgotten about, we're not ignoring, and that is The Godfather 1 and 2. We will do them, cinephiles. I absolutely promise they are going to happen. And uh, I'll come back for anything, except for like French movies. <laughs> <laughs> What makes The Cinephiles unique is the way that you guys tackle uh, the passion of all the characters and their themes, which is often more on John's side, I find. And then Steve gets into the analysis and the techniques of how did we convey that emotion. Uh, and I find that to be a wonderful interplay. 
and something that really just works perfectly between two hosts better than I've seen in basically any other podcast. The thing that I love about John and Steve is that both of them can look at negative things positively and can look at positive things critically. I think one of the things that makes The Cinephiles a really, really great podcast about cinema is that Steve and John are so completely different. And you gotta be, because the more each person brings to the table, the better the art will be. John might be the heart of cinephiles more and Steve might be the head. You know, if you have some person who's a left brain kind of person, another person's a right brain kind of person, then they're both gonna be one perfect brain. <laughs> this is the granddaddy of all the questions and that is what, what does Steve Morris bring to the cinephile? That is a loaded question. <laughs> Because sometimes I feel like Steve's married to me and to John and to the show. <laughs> but mostly it's really good because um, I see how much joy it brings to Steve. Well, I'll tell you, we wouldn't have a cinephile show without Steve Morris. That's the first thing because Steve Morris uh, was the one who uh, made this happen. Steve's the intellectual. I mean, Steve is the critical thinking guy, and you can hear how much he, he enjoys something or how much he loves a piece of film, but then he's able to go in and not only tell you why he loves it, but he has the technical specs <laughs> to back up his love. Steve brings um, not only his background as a director, but just the insane amount of research that tells us things we really never knew. And really the knowledge of the technical expertise you need to create a great film. For Steve, it's probably more of a beat by beat, scene by scene, word conversation, because that's how Steve looks at movies. He's a writer, first and foremost. He's an editor, probably second, I would say, and a director, third. And the editing that happens on the show that makes fans of so many people who discover the show for the first time is all down to Steve Morris and his idea of how he wanted the show to be. My favorite thing about the Cinephiles is actually the editing. Uh, it's so cool when you're in the room talking about movies and Steve kind of says, and then we talk about this and Doc Brown does this or the Beast does this and then there's an enchantment. But when you actually go listen to it after the fact and the editing and the dialogue and the music and everything and the way that like the conversation seamlessly moves in and out of the actual movie and the actual dialogue, it makes it magical even when it's something that you already sat and had a two hour conversation about. All of that is distinctly important and essential to make the cinephiles what it is. He spent so much of his life making all this great stuff that not, all, not as often as he would like was seen by enough people. And this is one of the few times in his life that he's doing something that he is intensely passionate about. He takes our show, um, so deeply inside of him and it's so important to him and it's actually getting heard and and it's also making a difference you know i love when i get to hear the the little notes and stuff that people sometimes write sometimes really amazing ones of like you know you saved my life kind of things my, my favorite moment of being on that show if steve morris is still laughing I know things are going okay. That's that's number one. All of you who listen to the show have gotten to know John Roca over the years. But what you don't know, or what maybe some of you can't see, is just how goddamn good he is at this job. And John Roca, and I know this because I've known him for a very long time, has a lot of hot takes and a lot of opinions, and also knows a ton about movies. <laughs> The first thing is just the sheer quantity of shows he records. It just blows my mind. I do one show a week. I'm exhausted. John does three, four shows a day. And he comes in with the same spirit, the same intensity, the same professionalism, and the ability to articulate something important over and over and over again. The way John approaches the cinephiles is the way that I feel like he approaches almost everything he does in life. And it is with red hot passion. <laughs> what John brings to the table is something a little more personal. I mean, I think John is like me. He's an enthusiast. Not just aesthetically, cinematically, stylistically, what makes a film work, but he'll get more into what made it work for him. John just 
feels and what he feels he wants you to know. And then John brings, you know, not only so much emotion and uh, his own background, but just the perspective of an actor. And I think John, first and foremost, comes out of acting. He connects with films and stories on, a, on an emotional level. I love watching John get emotional about something because he, he leans forward. He really wants you to, he wants you to understand what he's saying, but more importantly, he wants you to feel what he is feeling. Cobb is so determined to play it that way, so determined to be, to be right in this moment for his own reasons. That when the, I'm sorry, when that moment happens and he rips the picture of his son, which always makes me cry. Yeah. There's such a power in that because I know that anger. I've known men like this. I've been a man like this. You know. You know what? You're right. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm no, not trying to be no, right. I, it's just, it's my own it. point of view. Well, because you know? I mean, this is, and again, it's why I think this is good. You and I doing the show together. Mm -hmm. But you expressing how you felt. If you if you felt that, you're right. Mm -hmm. That was a real lesson for me because when the show is good, is when John and I are both expressing real truth. And so I've always gone like, I got to work up to his level. If he's going to bring it and everything that he feels into an episode, I got to bring the same thing. And that challenge has made me a better podcaster, but it's also made me closer to understanding my own emotions and being more comfortable with expressing them. So, you know, I just feel really lucky to have him as my partner on the show. Most guys who grew up in the 80s kind of have that relationship with Field of Dreams. Yeah. And hearing Steve and John get emotional about it gets, uh, even thinking about them getting emotional gets me emotional. <laughs> um, I mean, culminating with, you know, Dad, do you want to have, have a catch? Like, oh my God, just rips, rips my heart out. And the moment, now I'm going to start to cry because I have to say the line. Mm. He said, as he starts to go, he says, Hey, Dad, you want to have a catch? Hey, Dad? You want to have a catch? That line has broken so many people watching it, and certainly it broke me when I watched it again. <laughs> it just uh, broke me for the show. It just ago. broke you, right? <laughs> the great thing about listening to Steve and John talk about a movie is I want to go watch that movie right after I finish the podcast. The Cinephiles may end up being the greatest legacy that I'm a part of that I leave after I leave this earth. I can't take any greater pride than that uh, in the Cinephiles. So that's it. That's 200 episodes of the Cinephiles. <laughs> we want to thank all of you for all of your support throughout the show. There would be no cinephiles without you. And of course we want to thank all of our special guests for all of the podcasts they've yeah. participated in and particularly for willing to be on camera for our 200th episode. Absolutely. Can't thank them enough for taking the time. You know, uh, it, they take so much uh, time to be a part of the show, to have them also be a part of this 200th episode documentary really means a lot to both of us and certainly to you fans. I mean, so I see so many of you whenever Steve's on camera on assorted other shows going, oh, is that what Steve looks like? Well, the shoe's on the other foot, for me at least, and saying, oh, is that what that fan looks like? Is that what that longtime fan looks like? So it's been a joy to see the faces put to some of the names I've seen before as fans of our show. Uh, and thank you all so much for being with us for 200 episodes and beyond. We're not stopping this show anytime soon. And there is a plethora, a plethora of movies that we are going to get into as we keep going into the future. And we can't wait to dig into all those movies for 100, 200, 300 who knows how many more episodes we'll have, <laughs> but we'll be back every week with another great movie on The Cinephiles. <laughs>Two hundred episodes, you guys! Bravo! It is an honor to be in your company talking about movies on the Cinephiles. I mean it. C congrats on two hundred episodes. Uh, this is my favorite podcast. Two hundred episodes. That is a crazy, crazy accomplishment. And there are definitely certain movies that I'm waiting for that ten-year mark to hit, so I can hear you guys talk about them. <laughs> Thank you to Mr. Steve Morris and Mr. John Roca. You guys are awesome, and. Uh, Here's to another 200 episodes, so 
Good luck to you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of it, as often as you've let me be a part of it. Thank you guys so much for this opportunity. Can't wait to see the episode. Very honored that you guys uh, are, are letting me be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Congratulations on 200 episodes. Um, once again, congratulations. Uh, see you later. <laughs> All the best. Thanks. Best to both of you. Bye. And I look forward to 200 more episodes. And, uh, and you guys are awesome. All right. <laughs> okay. There you go. That was the uh, 200th episode documentary. First time seeing it. It was really well done. A lot of fun. Enjoyed that. Great reliving some of the moments uh, that Steve and I were witness to in those interviews, those um, conversations that we had with Sasha Pearl Raver and Scott Mance and Mike Ross and uh, Karen Morris and uh, Vogel and Shannon and Dave Rapp and Stephen Jones, Stephen B. Jones, all the people who were a part of that document, all the great fans who were in there as well. That was awesome uh, to see them uh, speak their uh, speak their opinions about the show and about everything we did, we have done and continue to do on the show. Uh, and yeah, you know, 200 episodes is kind of mind-blowing. You know, I've done... Uh, more episodes I've done, I've, I've, you know, my, most of my podcast is pretty high up there and, uh, you know, it's kind of, you know, I'm so used to just plugging forward every week and doing what I need to do that. I don't take that time. Most of the time to like sit back and realize how many episodes, um, I put out into the world of the multiple shows that I do. And it's, it's because I love doing it. You know, Steve said like, I, I he does three, two or three shows, three or four shows a day. Yeah. It's, I'm built to do it because I love to do it and it's a blast to be able to do it. I'm honored and blessed to have so many great fans and viewers of all the stuff that I do or listeners to all the stuff that I'm a part of. Uh, it means a lot. And the cinephiles is no exception to that at all. Steve's going to be coming on in a little bit. I told him sometime between six 30 and the seven to come on into the stream yard. So he will come on and we'll do some Q and a, uh, with you guys as well. And, uh, you know, kind of talk about everything but right now. Let's jump into some uh, stream live, some sentence chat. We're here. Brennan Mars sent a stream live in. He's the only one. No one else has sent the stream live in. Come on, people. Uh, Brennan Mars said, hello, John and Steve, please accept this donation as my Christmas and Hanukkah gift to you. No question. Rather. I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for further expanding my love cinema through the cinephiles podcast. Oh, that's very kind of you, Brennan. Thank you. I will read that to Steve when he comes in here. Uh, um, all right, what kind of questions do you have? Uh, do you guys have send us Streamlab or Super Chat in? Uh, Sean, I'm going to bring you in. Sean, are you listening to Cinephiles? You're not a Cinephiles guy. What's your, what's your problem? Um, I Dude, will tell you, I haven't watched it. That's a shame. But That's a watching shame. this, well, hang on. I'm about to give you a compliment. <laughs> hang on. I haven't watched it, but watching that documentary, and I have to find time to listen to it. Yeah, yeah. So, a lot of your favorite movies are in here. Uh, yeah, that, that's true. They are. And I, I don't know when I'm going to find the time because I don't have a lot of time to myself. <laughs> so, um, damn you, John. Damn you. Yeah. yeah damn that's you. That's all I'll say. Damn you. I love doing it. Uh, I got to take a quick break. Sean, will you hold down the show for like a minute? Sure. I can all do right. that. T talk to people about whatever you want to talk about it going on with the Outlaw Nation. I'll be right back, guys. Sure. No problem. So, hi, guys. How's everybody doing tonight? I can still read the chat, so if you guys want to ask me something or or whatever, I'll answer it. Um, I don't know. What are you guys, like in the chat, what are you guys' favorite episodes of the Cinephiles? Which one should I watch? That um, Have they done Wall Street? Because one of my favorite movies is Wall Street. So that's, that's the kind of movie um, that got me into um, loving movies and being a movie fan. That was the first movie I kind of fell in love with. So, no, I, I haven't have a PS5 yet, Andrew G. So, but again, I'm not worrying about it. I'm sure by the time, um, no, they haven't done Wall Street yet. Oh, well, that's, um, I'm, I would look forward to them doing that. <laughs> um, they've done Network. Oh, okay. Network's cool. Um, I will be interested to hear them do the Godfather movies. That I can't wait for that. I'll be looking forward to that. But, um, yeah, 
How long are their episodes usually? Are they usually like an hour or so, like two hours? Yeah, well, in the doc, it said like about two hours. Damn it. Ah, Jesus. What is your actual job? Uh, <laughs> I really don't want to say. I, I work for a, a tech company. I'll put it that way. We're watching Godfather 3. You know what? I haven't seen all of Godfather 3. I own all the Godfathers, and I haven't actually sit down and watched Godfather 3 in a, as an uh, entire run. I got to do that one of these days. So, uh, But I definitely love the first two. Um, do they do the... Um, what's like the... the I, obviously, they've done Back to the Future because that was in the doc. Um, have they done any like... Uh, any comic book movies like um, any of the MCU movies, or have they done any of the the DC movies like like the original Superman? Oh yeah, they said that Superman. Uh, but they have they done like Man of Steel or the Dark Knight? Those would be interesting. I think I see as a savage. I've heard. I've heard. Whew, thank you for that, my man. I appreciate. They it. did Black Panther. Yeah, I heard they <laughs> did Black Panther. Yeah, I'm just asking the the audience what they've. Which uh, ones you guys have done already that I might be interested in watching? Yeah, Black Panther. We did that with Steve, uh, Jay Washington and Winston A. Marshall. They were yeah. Wasn't that a three parter? It was a or, three parter for I think oh my the first three parter we ever did. So pretty crazy to think about. Um, I don't know when in the, how many hours <laughs> I'm gonna find the time to listen. To. <laughs> uh, put it on your list, man. All right, uh, let me bring in Steve. I'll drop you out, Sean. Thanks so much for holding the court. I appreciate it. No problem. No problem. Cool. All right, let's uh, bring on my uh, partner and my co-host on The Sin of Oz. We just finished watching uh, the documentary and uh, uh, reliving a lot of my favorite uh, moments, uh, uh, you know, being a part of the construction of this documentary, some of the interviews that we did, and hearing from some of the fans, which was my first time hearing so much of uh, their responses and, and their thoughts about our show. Pretty humbling stuff. Uh, and remember, Streamlabs and Super Chats are open, ladies and gentlemen. So as I bring Steve... Morris in here, who is the writer and director of this ep of this uh, Cinephiles documentary. Please send in your Streamlabs and Super Chats. And if you're a $10 above Outlaw Nation patron, you're going to get to come in live and ask your question of us as well. All right. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, writer, director, producer, and my partner on the Cinephiles, Steve Morris. How are you, bud? I'm good. I just got back from working out. So it's a good thing this isn't smell o vision because otherwise... <laughs> It would be kind of ugly. That means you've got the endorphins going. That's good. I like it. Absolutely. Like it. <laughs> you feel happy. That's good. I do. Uh, um, hey, my yeah. my internet's like going, I don't know if I'm coming through all right, but it, things seem pretty janky on my end. So You're doing fine. You, you're awesome. coming through fine. Yeah, you're yeah. good to go. You're I'm like to figure out my life. up and all sorts of weird stuff's happening. Oh, I am? Yeah, but it might be on my end. I don't know. All right. Sean, am I going in and out? Are you guys see me going in and out? No? Okay, cool. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. So, dude, I just finished watching the documentary. First time ever. What a reaction, man. I mean, what a experience for sure. And uh, seeing how many people, how many of our fans sent in their stuff. That was great. It's from all over the world. That was awesome to experience and to see. Uh, so the documentary was an hour and 11 minutes long, but it had been longer than that. What was the longest, the first original cut of the documentary? I think the how very, the very first cut that nobody saw. <laughs> uh was an hour and 38 mm. i think the first one that anyone saw was like an hour and a half yeah 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 um, but that's always i mean that's normal you know i mean like that that's you know i've had cuts of things that are it, it's usual that i would try to cut out on my first pass cut out 10 percent of the movie you yeah know, which i think i did and then the next one cut out seven or eight percent of the movie and the next one cut out five percent of the movie and then what tends to happen what i find is you get down to a point where it gets too cutty that's what i would call yeah. it where it right. seems really charged and then you want to put some air back in mm -hmm. you know there were certain lines you know from certain people that i was like oh i missed that line let's bring that back in so yeah. then it expanded out uh, you know a minute or two back on the final cut what, what was the inspiration for you to do the documentary? What was it? Uh, cataloging the 200 episode, I get it. But like, what was the inspiration, the impetus? What motivated you to come up with this as an idea and then to pursue it uh, as strongly and fervently as you did? Well, uh, insanity. I mean, I would say that's probably the first <laughs> the first one. Um, I, uh, I It started because for the last, you know, four years at every we had 50 at 100 150 we would do these q and a's and they were always fun and our fans would send in 
questions and you and I would answer them. Yeah. And the first thing was, I was like, well, you know, I kind of want to do something different. And then the second thought I had is because we've been so much more disciplined about our cinephile shorts mm. that are up on Patreon that you and I are regularly every week answering questions from fans. Yeah. And because we've been doing a few of these live streams every once in a while, it's another place that we've been answering questions from fans. So it yeah. seemed weird to just answer more questions from fans. Not that I don't like doing it. It's totally right. fun. And then it just, I mean, you know, I, I, I I feel weird saying it this way, but you know, you're a creative person, shit pops into your brain, you know, mm -hmm. like I had an idea and then the idea got bigger. And then the idea is like, well, I, I want to celebrate. And we have these people that are really part of our family. I mean, some of them literally part of our family. Yeah. And some of them are friends for a real long time. And some of them just people that are part of the show. And it's like, well, how can we celebrate it? And I, I I, you know, there was this sort of like wanting to kind of look back at the show, but then also the show to me is so much about the love of film and your love of film and my love of film and the people that we have on the show. And we all share this thing. And I just, yeah. I had this feeling that there was a way to connect it, you yeah. know? Yeah. That, I think that's kind of where it came from. Yeah. Well, I, I could tell you this as I was watching the, uh, the film and I had the occasion to look over to the chat so many people were like complimentary and positive and were like, thank you for the show. Thank you for this. Uh, uh, and thanking, uh, you know, us for the um, creation of the show and talking about how they had enjoyed numerous episodes and were naming them by name in the chat. Oh, that's was, cool. Which was great to see. You know, I made it very clear. This is a celebration of the cinephiles episode of the outlaw nation show. Cause I wanted to watch this documentary with the fans raw uh, and react to it as it was going on. I enjoyed the hell out of it. It was over before I knew it was over, uh, which is always a positive. Um, and I, I, I found some new things to laugh about from some of the comments uh, uh, there and the timing of them all and how you constructed it at all. Uh, when you were editing this uh, documentary, how, I mean, how, were you were you like Carrie? What's her face on Homeland? You have a board with like you know all the postcards and the red lines of <laughs> yarn attaching it. Like how how did you or did you kind of like uh, feel your way organically through this one? It's it's very much the latter, and okay. and this is um, I've developed you know because I've done some documentaries before. It's it's weird. My first professional editing jobs was editing like behind the scenes things from bonus features on DVDs. Right. So like in a weird way, this was coming back to that yeah. on, on some level. Um, but from doing the great white shark documentaries and some of the stuff with the Cousteaus, I developed this completely bizarre methodology. Yeah. Um, and, and what it, it's, it's, it's all crazy. So I just, I'll just tell you the things that I do um, is, I mean, for this documentary in particular, I asked everyone the same questions. You yeah. know, so I asked, what was your first great movie experience? I asked, what was, tell me about a mind blowing movie. Right. And, um, and then depending on what people answered, then there was follow up questions and, and stuff like that. So what I then did was I took everybody's answer to what was your first great movie? And I just put that into a long timeline. So it would be like 45 minutes of people talking about their first great movie. Right. And I would just watch it. And then I would watch it a second time. And the second time I go, okay, let's take out the stuff I know is not going to be in the movie. Right. So if someone kind of stumbles or they kind of go off track. So now that 45 minutes has become 35 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then I watch it again. And then I take other pieces out. And then I kind of start to go, well, that piece is really interesting. And so I kind of might move it somewhere or highlight it. And then what happens, and this is why it's just a completely organic thing, yeah. is connections pop up. You know, like for instance, um, there's the first great movie and there's Shannon and Michael Ross. Right. And I go, oh, they're both talking about their dads. Right. That's what this is about. And so I just put them next to each other. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how I'm going to cut it together. You know, and then Karen and Sasha, their movie was E.T. So I was like, well, right. let's put that together. And then uh, Michael's and Dave Rapp's also fit together. That was unexpected but then it's like dave started listing these elements that he liked in wizard of oz yeah and michael was listing elements he liked in uh labyrinth and i was like well, let's put those next to each other and it just happened and and you know and things pop into my brain like i'll hear because uh, you know now i've watched all of these sequences dozens of times mm -hmm. you know so now i'm hearing this person say something and i go oh my god i i need to grab that moment from 
John who said this great thing that relates to this and then I would put it next to each other. So that's the process and that's why it's slow and that's why I don't want anyone to watch me edit because it makes no sense at all that I'm doing it. I have no plan, you know. Well, did as it, well. I think it was edited fantastically, and I got you got a lot of compliments in the chat as well. Oh, that's editing. nice. Thank you. you. Did. Level two trading, especially, was uh, very complimentary about your editing on the documentary. My question, my next question for you is: is as, you, as you're putting this together, did you discover from some of the responses, either from our guests or the fans, um, anything new about the show or the power of the show or the effect of the show on these people's lives? I, I uh, so much, I think, I mean, it's, I mean, you, you know, you've done this, you know, so much more than me, but it's always kind of amazing when people, you, you know, we're doing this out. We're sitting, I'm sitting in my office. You're sitting in your office. Yeah. We're in our empty spaces. Yeah. And it's always sort of amazing to see the face of a person who you've touched in some way mm -hmm. and, and that there are people who know things about the show that I hadn't even thought about, you yeah, know, yeah. that have like that say, well, I've listened to this episode over and over again and I know this thing. And it's like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. It's also interesting. I mean, part of, you know, our guests are so great and so articulate and so smart, yeah. but they really know things about the show too. I mean, Scott Mance, yeah. you know, I had no idea he listened to the show. Yeah. Yeah. I had no idea. And it's really obvious that he does and how much, I mean, you know, from the very first time he was on the show, it was obvious that he got what we were doing, mm -hmm. but it was so cool to hear him articulate it that way. Yeah. And the same with Sasha. Sasha's only been on the show twice. Yeah, yeah. And yet for me, she's just part of, she's a perfect cinephile guest, you know? Yeah. So, so many of them, obviously Michael Vogel, like, I mean, he he totally gets the show and understood. By the way, he is an unbelievably good interview. <laughs> I mean, he's so like, he, I was like, well, I need something like this. He's like, oh, like this? And then he would go, boom. And I was like, yeah, that was it. Okay, next thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, there are people waiting to ask us questions, Steve. So let me bring on one of them because they, ha they have a bit of a hard out. Uh, Brennan, what's up, Brennan? How are you, brother man? Hey, guys. Good, good to hey, see Brennan. you. Hey Steve, good to see you again. Good to see you. By the way, um, I loved. I'm waiting for. I'm waiting very expectantly for your sequel episode, uh, The Untouchables. I'm still waiting. For <laughs> oh that. yes, I was editing it today. It's coming. We Got recorded it. it. Was that yes Saturday? We recorded Saturday. Saturday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I just uh, thank you guys so much for everything you do with your show. Uh, you're uh, it, it is such a wonderful show. You know, I, I wasn't sure how I felt about Unforgiven, but then I listened to the your guys episode on it and I went, okay. I think I understand what's going on there. So that's great, man. Well, I, but uh, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from John on that one because that's yeah. so your movie and yeah. it was, yeah, that, that was a really interesting discussion. Well, I mean, just like Brief Encounter, I learned so much from Brief Encounter because that's your movie. You, know, right. you turned me around on that movie by the well, that's a that's a rarity in in, in our uh, discussions, you know, where I start out feeling one way about a movie and then completely change by the end of, of the discussion. So um, all right. Um uh, yeah. Brandon, I guess my question would be what are some movies that you didn't like? Well, we're kind of iffy on, but then when, after doing the cinephiles, you like them better. Well, that, I mean, I, you know, we yeah. just, I mean, Unforgiven wasn't, certainly wasn't one that I didn't like. Um, I know for, uh, uh, for me, like French Connection was one that was never a movie that I loved. Mm. But John likes it, loves it much more than me. But recent, it's so important. And so I learned so much doing it. So uh, that, that was certainly one that kind of changed our mind. And the, and the, you know, obviously we talked about Zorro the Gay Blade in the dark, yeah. you know, where like John's love for it just kind of really brought me in. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of other ones. I would, you, yeah. I would throw Network out there, brother. Like Network is one that I'd seen kind of once or a little bit before the show. And then just like uh, talking it through with you and, with you uh, uh, kind of got me uh, to understand the film even more. You know, there are some of these 70s films that in my mind, even though I love 70s films, there are some of these films that I feel get dated and I thought Network was going to be dated and I couldn't have been more yeah, wrong. I watched it and then saw your episode afterwards and I went, yeah, this isn't dated at all. This is still very... Yeah, topical. Very topical. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Even more so. Even more so than... Even ever. more so, yeah. 
as we hear about these other news organizations, quote unquote, branching off to become their own thing so they can keep spinning conspiracy theories at nutty points of view. Mm, yeah. Corrupt people to believe a certain way. So it's just like, yeah, you're seeing that happen even more so uh, nowadays. The network was just so prescient uh, about that. Oh, yeah. Don't fuck with my distribution. Uh, <laughs> Another oh, one, by the way, was uh, Chariots of Fire. Which we, uh, which I liked. I mean, mm. I knew it was a good yeah. movie, and I knew it was one of John's favorites. It, I cried so much in talking about it. Like it struck such a chord, and I didn't think it was going to be a two-part episode. We ended up talking for like four hours on yeah. it. It was just there was so much there that I didn't expect. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Well, that's been the joy of doing the show. Is it is like the movies that speak to both of us the other one gets to experience it all over again through a different lens through a different point of view yeah. through a different set of eyes and i think we both do that for the people who listen to the show as well like we give them a whole and i think it's almost like uh and i don't want to overstate it too much but for people who are film and this is what i'm getting my reaction to watching the documentary right is that for people who are um into films this mm -hmm. podcast is like water uh, to if you're thirsty and you can come and have some drinks with us and satisfy your thirst and enjoy the conversation as well. Yeah, yeah. it's killing two birds. And your water. episode on Black Panther was oh, so yeah. fun. Those, those and are great. Jay and Jay and Winston are <laughs> what a what a funny bunch they are. Oh yeah, but that they because they, yeah. they brought such kind of their own level of. Because we can appreciate the film, you know, on our own level, but they, being African Americans, really, it means so much to them. Yeah. So anyhow, that's all I got. But thank you guys, and uh, Steve. If I don't see you again before Christmas, Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah. Thank you very much, Brennan. Good seeing you again, and good to see you, John. And we'll yep. talk to you guys soon. Definitely, Brennan. Thank all you. Right. So much thank you, there, brother. Much Bye. love. Uh, yeah, Brennan also sent us a stream live. Steve, he said, hello, John and Steve, please accept this donation as my Christmas and Hanukkah gift to you. No question. Rather, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for further expanding my love of cinema through the Cinephiles podcast. So very cool. Wow, that's great. That's great. That to us. Uh, yeah, definitely. Let's, uh, let's bring on Andrew G, who's uh, coming in from Canada. What's up, dude? Hey, guys. How you doing? Steve, meet Andrew. Andrew, meet Steve. Hey, Andrew. How are you doing, Steve? <laughs> uh, I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, well, that was the second time I actually watched the documentary. I, I oh, watched cool. it over the weekend, and I really enjoyed it. Oh, that's great. I think it, it was really fun to watch and see everyone, all the guests and, and everyone come in and say what they think of your show. And so I just wanted to quickly say that I like it's one of my favorite podcasts for sure. It's the way you guys really get deep into stuff, especially the way you kind of get into how and why things are done in movies, like the behind the scenes stuff, Steve. Yeah. Because that's, that's something that I've always, always loved. Like, you know, when they started putting that stuff on DVDs and commentaries and it's like listening to a DVD commentary, just right. not from like the actual filmmakers, but um, <laughs> my, I think my first episode was the two part Akira one with uh, Emma Fife. Yeah. And I very quickly, went back and started listening to older episodes and and it's it's gotten me to watch movies that I've never seen before and now are some of my favorites and also the way you guys kind of changed the way I think about other movies like Brendan mentioned the Black Panther episodes which I'm kind of just I think I'm starting the second part uh, in a couple mm -hmm. days and already I'm like it's a movie I like but now I'm like wow I'm thinking about this movie on a completely another another level now mm -hmm. and that's I, part I, of it I did too, by the way, in researching that movie. I mean, I totally liked the movie. Yeah. But then in researching it, I was like, man, this movie is, there's a lot here that I didn't understand that I had to find out. Yeah, yeah for sure. Agreed. Um, my favorite episodes are with Scott Mance, of course. <laughs> and I hope I hope you guys get him back on a few more next year. I'm sure you will. Oh, yeah. We've already um, been talking to him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Andrew, I'm curious. So what are some of the movies that you had never seen that became your favorites? Um, definitely some of the, the Kurosawa stuff, because at the time yeah. I was just kind of, something that I've always loved, but I never really got into watching a lot of those until I started listening to like the seven samurai episode or Yojimbo, 
And now those are two of my like favorite movies ever. And it's part of the reason that I was kind of pushed to like start watching more of those was because I was listening to the way you guys were talking about those movies. Mm -hmm. And um, and I've always loved the samurai, samurai world anyways. But uh, th those are definitely a couple. Um, I can't think of too many off the top of my head, but those are definitely two of them. Definitely Seven Samurai. I think I listened to that episode quite a few times, actually. Yeah. So I I, um, I, I saw your comments in the chat and you or saying how you wish we did more animated films. Yeah. Are there films that you would love to see us do or love to see us tackle? And I think, Steve, and I hesitated at animated films because we are not like technically that knowledgeable about animation uh and i hope i can speak for steven saying that like we we love animals we enjoy animated films but we, we don't get bone deep like michael vogel would and so uh, maybe he hesitate. would be a good guest for some of, of course of course of course well he has said like i yeah. need to I, I need to do more animation he's definitely said it so we just have to make it happen yeah i know you've done a couple but i it's something that i was like it would be cool to see a, a few more here and there hmm. um because there's definitely some great animated movies that you guys haven't touched but um i don't know exactly which ones any ones you want i would listen to okay um but uh something i just watched that i would love to see you guys do one day i, I don't think you've done it yet but for the first time i watched once upon a time in the west oh just yeah. a couple nights ago and i really enjoyed it and i'm gonna watch it again so i can kind of like get get more into what's going on there mm -hmm. so that's something i would like to see one day i haven't seen that in a long time that was one that was that there were certain films in film school that just came up a lot, like Jaws all the time. Jaws is coming up. North by Northwest, obviously Citizen Kane and Lawrence Arabia. But Once Upon a Time in the West for sound design, for cinematography, for storytelling came up yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah. 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 Um, That's what, uh, they, and they just did the reissue mm. a few years ago. And I remember I went to the new Beverly to see the reissue, the remastered version of it. Um, and fell back in love with the movie. And, you know, it's a Sergio Leone film uh, that you can, that sometimes seems to get forgotten when they talk about his great films. They talk about, you know, the obviously the, the Clint Eastwood trilogy and all of that, but people forget about this film, just like they forget about Once Upon a Time in America as well. Like, these are incredibly epic, awesome films. And Henry Fonda being a villain, for God's sakes, it's yeah. a great moment steely eye those steely blue eyes shooting down a kid it's pretty crazy so yeah i i, I mean the second listen i'll never say no to more westerns for god's sake so <laughs> sure i would love to do it at some point down the road for sure maybe next year we'll see yeah uh, the one sad thing i think of our episodes just continually getting longer and longer <laughs> and more complicated is we do we do fewer and fewer films you know that's, that's true the one downside because it's just you know it's which the, is they're epic, you know. Yeah, which is why we're considering, or we're, we've agreed to do like these kind of maybe monthly or maybe bi-monthly, these like one hour or hour and fifteen minute conversations about a film that we that wouldn't make necessarily the cinephiles cut, but would be something that, but still films that we would like to talk about. So that's kind of how we're gonna maybe add more films that we're speaking about uh, onto the onto the podcast. Uh, yeah, I think that'll I, that'll be great. Um, yeah. the, you know, the, there's so many movies. There are also there's so many movies that I have love for that aren't great films. Oh, you know, yeah, for sure. Um, that would just be really fun to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to those Godfather ones because I've I've just been rewatching those. I just watched Godfather three for the first time in like 15 years because I'm going to watch Coda like tomorrow yeah. maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I and I'm like I haven't seen the third one in a long time, so I I want to watch that. And then I'll watch the new version so I can see what you know what the differences are. Definitely. Um, so I'm going to probably hit that this week, maybe tomorrow. But anyways, uh, I'll I'll go and uh, I won't take too much more time. So <laughs> thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Thanks so much, Andrew. See you guys. Much love, bud. Uh, all right, and Sean, my producer on the show, wants to come in and ask us a question as well. Sean, go ahead. How are you, man? I'm good. Uh, how's it going, Steve? Good. How are you doing, Sean? Good. So I just subscribed to you guh's uh, podcast. Well, thank, thank you. And I was just looking through the list and I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, when am I going to find the hours to listen to all this stuff? Because there's some great movies on here that I'm like, oh man. Because John doesn't know this, but I love uh, behind the scenes stuff. So mm. the reason why I buy Blu-rays and I have like, 
I might have like over 400 Blu-rays, Whoa. Um, is wow. that I love behind the scenes stuff. Like I'll watch the movie, but I'm really just watching it because I want to watch the behind the scenes stuff. I'm like, oh, I didn't learn this. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know this. So this kind of seems like to me, and the document, I told John, the documentary kind of like sold me on you guys' um, podcast is that like you guys just doing some deep behind the scenes oh, yeah. um, a, a, I can't, I can't analysis of it. I can't believe it's taking you long to find us. It sounds like we are the perfect podcast for you. Yeah, <laughs> I know, but because I've heard John talk about it, but just like multiple yeah, times. I, I I know, I know, but I don't have a lot of hours in the day to do things. But now I got to try to find hours in the day to do this. So um, I I will be a vavid listener from here on out. So so John, you could thank Steve for oh. doing a documentary because he got oh, me on board. That's fine. otherwise. I wouldn't. I I probably wouldn't be. Maybe who knows? <laughs> but I do have a recommend. Two recommendations for you guys. Oh, you you already request. You just subscribed three seconds ago. <laughs> yeah, why not? Got some uh, on you, kid. All right. Well, go well, you don't want it. Oh, I can leave. Go uh, no, that's true. Uh, Wall Street is um, yeah. my favorite movie. Did we do it's Wall the. Street? I thought we did Wall Street. Have we not done Wall Street? Yet? No, no. Okay. We just talked about it as part of a short. Yeah. But that's all we've yeah. done. I, okay. I I love Wall Street. It is my favorite movie. It's the movie that made me fall in love with movies. So I would highly recommend doing that. Wall Street. I'd be I'd be vividly waiting for to hear that. And sure. you guys want to do more animated movies? The one I would recommend is the one that I'm using my green screen about Batman: The Mask of Phantasm. Mm. I think if we do that, man, we'd have to get Jason Inman as our guest. Oh, sure. Dark Knight, that's, and so it's great one. to have him on because he loves that movie. Uh, maybe have him and Vogel on because I know Vogel's going to fight to want to be on that as well. So uh, yeah, if we yeah. do an animated movie without Vogel, <laughs> it's going to be a problem. It's going to be hell to pay for sure. Because I think that's the best Batman movie that's not called The Dark Knight is Mask of the Phantasm. Okay, it's great. I haven't seen it in a, long, a while, but it's really good. I Treat yourself, know. Steve. Treat yourself. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anything else, Sean? Are you good? No, no. Uh, now I got to try to carve out hours to listen to all these podcasts. So yeah. again, uh, thank yeah. you. Listen to it while you're working out. Listen to it while you're showering. Listen to it while you're having your constitution in the bathroom. There are plenty of places you can listen to it. Taking a walk down the street, uh, all kinds of take an hour walk to clear your head. Listen to our podcast. So there's. Or I might just take make uh, get less sleep. Yeah, who needs who sleep? Needs sleep. Who needs sleep? Five or six uh, is more than enough. <laughs> let us know. Let us know how it goes, Sean. I, I care, yeah. Yeah. I might actually start with uh, the uh, the Black Panther ones, or uh, I saw the Untouchables in there. I love the Untouchables, oh, yeah. so yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I'll, I'll I'll definitely let John know. I'll definitely. Yeah. All, all right, all right, brother. Good to see you. All right, there's Sean Barito. Uh All right, Steve. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let me bring this back up for us. But yeah, I mean, uh, what else would you say? Was there any struggles you had in putting this thing together? Obviously, uh, other than what we had talked about before. Uh, with like you know trying to compile everything and connect everything, but like, were there any were there any challenges here that you hadn't experienced in creating the other stuff that you've created, the films you've directed or documentaries you've made? Yeah, I mean, so a couple things. Um, first of all, this is a really weird movie. I mean, it's, you know, it's like <laughs> yeah, know. you said that in a text exchange, and I was like, what does that mean? Well, yeah. it's all talking heads of people recorded over Zoom calls, mm. and, and and one of the things like like there are things. There is a technique in this movie that I swore I would never use, but it's the only way to do it, yeah. which is the constant jump cuts of mm. within the interview. So you see, like you're watching a person and they jump and they jump and they jump because right. I'm cut it, cutting together different lines of dialogue uh, to to shape it. And normally the technique you would use, because that's I do that all the time, yeah, but then right. you cut to B roll. So if I have someone like I'm doing a great white shark documentary and I have someone talking about, oh, I was in the water and I saw the shark do this. And there's seven cuts that I put into their dialogue mm -hmm. to make it sound good. Well, then I'm cutting to the shark that you're seeing the shark do the thing. Right. And so that's covering up all these weird cuts that I'm doing. So I didn't have any B-roll. I mean, that's why I wrote to you. I was like, can you send me a picture or something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because also the other thing is it's so visually um, sterile because, I, by the way, it's very strange that the, that we did an intro to the movie shot in the same location of the interviews of all the movie. And now we're doing a and a about the movie where we're still sitting in the same spot, yeah. you know. So visually, this movie is very... Um, bland you know it's just talking heads yeah. and so not that's why you know being able to cut to a movie poster cut to a still just to give it some 
visual difference was was very challenging. Mm -hmm. It's also weird. People don't generally make documentaries about themselves. Yeah, you know. And so one of my biggest fears, and I wrote to you, and I we fortunately had a few other people to be able to watch the film, was like. I really didn't want it to come off arrogant and self-aggrandizing. I wanted it to come off as here's this project that we're all passionate about, but I didn't want it to be like, look how great Steve is, you know, <laughs> like that was very uncomfortable for me. Yeah. And so trying to find the balance where it's, it, you know, it, it, it expressed some of the love, but didn't go like, Hey, we're the best podcast in the world. I didn't want to do that. Um, it also normally, if I do a film, I would screen it with people because you become so myopic when you're editing because you're watching the same sequence yeah. over and over. I mean, you know, there are sequences, you know, 20, 30, 40 times that I'd watched the sequence. And so it becomes very difficult to judge. Like, is this good? Is this boring? Is it make sense? Is it fast and slow? And right. watching a movie in a room with 10 or 20 people or five people, it becomes really clear. You can feel someone's interest is lagging or you can yeah. feel that they're involved. Or you can hear that they laugh. And it's, and not, I was never able to do that, you know? So, because we're in the COVID world, I watched it with Karen once, like, wow. that's it. Other than that, there's no screening. So it was just, you know, I was, it was pretty alone. I got a little bit of feedback from some people I sent it to. So th th those are the challenges that I'd say were unique to this mm -hmm. film. Yeah. Uh, well, we've got some stream labs that have come in, Steve, let me ask, uh, ask, answer some, uh, let's put this out there and see, get some answers. And if, uh, please uh, keep sending in your stream labs to small bots, sorry, stream labs to super chats. Uh, got about another 22 minutes before we wrap this up here uh, on the Outlaw Nation show. So if you have a question you want to ask Steve or me about, or both of us about the Cinephiles uh, or about how we do the show, please feel free to send us in, especially those of you who are burgeoning podcasters who've been hesitating about it. You know, this, like he says in the documentary, this came up during just a conversation randomly at a party. Uh, just that's the agenda yeah. Of this show so you never know what can happen and what it can lead to so uh all right keith archer says thank you guys for the show while i have plenty of favorites my most memorable episode was willy wonka and the chocolate factory one line did it for me fuck, fuck grandpa, grandpa joe, joe. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely uh and i think that was uh, yuri who who, yeah. did, who said that and so we just kind of uh, you know latched onto it and it's been a great and at some point if we ever do t-shirts we have to do hashtag Fuck Grandpa, Fuck Grandpa Joe. Joe. You know? uh, <laughs> well, it's funny that the other thing that because you actually said it's in the doc, we should make a T-shirt of that. Is ooh. Sasha Pro Raver saying Willy Wonka's golden ticket to the fuck factory of yeah. China? <laughs> it's funny <laughs> that the two Willy Wonka things are T-shirt worthy. Yeah, I agree a thousand percent. Uh, yeah, Sean put it in the chat. Let's get to 100 likes, everybody. If you haven't uh, to put a thumbs up on this one, please feel free to do so. Send in your questions as well. Your Streamlabs in your super chats. Uh, Jay Curdy says, well done on the doc. Um, I'm curious, what's the story behind the intro music? Yes, Steve, what is the story behind our rock and roll intro music? It's free. <laughs> That's truth, yeah. actually. It's it one is. of those, you know, uh, it, uh, when we were first starting the show and I had actually talked to a musician about composing something and um, and then I was on YouTube and YouTube has some, all basically all the music in the documentary, by the way, is free music off of YouTube, except for one piece of music that I paid for. Mm -hmm. um, but other than, but I was looking around on YouTube for a little piece of music. I wanted something that had, that was fun and driving forward and had a build to it. And I found that and I actually still like it. I, th I, t I totally like that little piece of music. Same with that little tag at the end. Just mm -hmm. two free pieces of music off YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Dan Collins says, I'm broke, but I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts on how you select slash consider your film choices for the show in the context of film canons that have historically been possibly exclusionary. Well, all right, Steve. Any answers on this one? It's a very scientific process involving a complex algorithm based on years of research and study, audience uh, um, surveys, and a sense of the demographics that were, no, it's just totally random. <laughs> it's, you know, like, and, and what's so funny, there is there is a schedule. We have our next yeah. two, uh, three months theoretically laid out, yeah. and there is no way we're going to do it. Like, we yeah. never, are, it never happens. We never make our, it constantly changes because... Uh, Sean Connery passed away. Yep. Uh, Chadwick Boseman passed away. So that changed our schedule. And then that, then we were suddenly coming up on Halloween. So we had to get our Halloween one in. And then we just yesterday we recorded 
what I thought was going to be a one part episode oh, that yeah. came from a, a guest who is fantastic. And yeah. I, and we were having such a great conversation that I went, John and I both went, Oh, this is going to be two parts. Yeah. And it was a movie that was never in our schedule. It was just that th we had an opportunity to do something with the guest. And he said, sent us like six or seven movies, five of which we had done. Yeah. And so it was between two and both John and I picked it. And it's like, so there is, it, I, I wish it was more organized. I feel like we're, I, I don't know if you feel this way, John. I feel like we're constantly shifting things and, you know, we have these plans of things we're going to do that just don't happen, you know? Well, it's like life, you know, we, we, we have uh, plans of what we'd like to do, but life gets in the way people die, famous people die or uh, situations call for us to review it uh, or to look at a film uh, or for whatever reason, like you said, we have a publicist reach out to us, pitch us their writer who has got a film out right now. And we said, we say, great. And, and we ask them to send us a list of movies and we select from those movies. So it's just, uh, um, yes, it's regimented, but just like the show within the regiment, there is free flowing stuff that happens within it. Uh, and like we said, at the end of the documentary, there are so many more movies uh, for us to talk about. We haven't scratched the surface of, as Steve said, of so many of the great films uh, that uh, that are out there for us to still explore and experience and talk about. Well, and as you you said, it's like you, you know you want to get back more into classic films, yeah. and we're, we're, we were better at the beginning of the show of doing different eras. Yeah, you know, and I think we've been less good in this last year, and not you know because things happen the way they happened. Yeah. But you and I both would like their movies in the. 20s 30s 40s 50s 60s that i want to get to yeah you know that we really haven't done yeah and we will we will at some point yeah. uh douglas rutner says, can i ask a question about a specific uh can i ask a question about a specific film related question they did on the cinephiles yes douglas ask it send it in i'll bring it up here on the screen uh kevin merton says i would love to see a lion king episode uh, isn't that vote is that vogel's favorite it's one of his favorites isn't oh, it? oh yeah absolutely he loves the lion king he I, loves I mean i think we should do it I yeah, do it. I'm down with that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there are a lot of people asking. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, three parter of the Black Panther. A lot of people love that. We did Iron Man and Dark Knight. Yes, that's for sure. Um, let's and see. Superman. Superman was like yeah. our third episode or something. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, they've done Network. Yes, absolutely done. We haven't done Wall Street. Yeah, Douglas, ask your question. He keeps asking if he can ask the question. I'm just asking the question, my man. Uh, level two says, Shannon's comments in the air got me. Yeah, I mean, uh, Steve, let's address that real quick. Obviously, our uh, friend Shannon McClung, who was all over this documentary, uh, and he's a geek buddy uh, with the other show we do, he, um, his father uh, recently passed away, and uh, you know he, he approved us talking about it. Uh, and it was so uh, difficult to watch some of his um, moments because of what happened with his father recently passing away and how he's referencing his dad. Now he's talking about his experiences. Um, did that strike you too as you were editing this, as you were watching this, uh, this final cut? 100%. And, and it's funny because I'm, I'm, I'm of really three minds about it. Uh, the, the first is, oh, I hope this is my dear friend, Shannon, who I love. And I, I, this might be hard for him and I don't want to hurt him at this moment. That's so vulnerable. Mm. And then there's another part of me that says, I know that down the line, this will be something he'll treasure. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I know it might be hard, but the fact that there's a record of him saying these, you know, before it all happened, before yeah. he, you know, knew his dad was going to pass away, saying these really touching things, mm -hmm. I knew that that would be meaningful. And mm -hmm. then there's the third part of me, which is the director who said, this is good. I have to keep it in, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the completely uncaring <laughs> person who was just like, this is a really strong. I mean, him talking about Field of Dreams at the end, I, you know. Uh, it very quickly figured out like, well, that's the end of the movie somehow. Somehow I have to end the movie with that because that was the most moving. It was incredibly moving episode when we did it. And then yeah. Shannon talking about it just felt like that's the end. You know, yeah, absolutely. It was. Um, all right. Uh, Pierre LNT says, you guys like the Iron Giant? I'd like a cinephile to that film. Me too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, Douglas just he's just a tease about this question. <laughs> no, Douglas won't answer the won't uh, le- reveal the question. But I'm re- I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to do the cinema. I mean, uh, the Iron Giant as well. It's a film I've only seen twice, and I haven't seen it in a very long time. But I know a lot of people in this sphere uh, that I'm in are um, I love that movie and speak about it with such reverence, you know. And so yeah, that would be a fun one, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Uh, nice, by the way. I see someone who said their favorite was All the President's Men, which yeah. you know, yep, that, Karen Karen was great on that episode. I agree. <laughs> yeah, and that clip you used of her was great. That just yeah. is a perfect tease for the kind of analysis she had throughout the whole episode. It was great to have her on there. Uh, she said your rear. He said, or uh, Bean, Beans Baxter also said your rear window commentary was great mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, I see uh, at Parties Over Network, yeah. uh, we did Superman 1978. So uh, the other ones we haven't done. Right. Uh, We're not Franken- doing yeah. the sit, pal. Let me tell you that right now. But anyway, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Frankenstein is an interesting one I've thought about. Yeah, yeah. I would love to do Frankenstein. I think that it's the that's, in my opinion, that's the best one of those, including Dracula, including Wolfman, including the mummy or creature of the black lagoon. Yeah. Frankenstein is the one that I enjoy the most out of that time. And we uh, could revisit Nosferatu and return to your childhood trauma. <laughs> God. And we should, like you mentioned in the documentary, they did going back and to some of these old uh, German films from the 1920s. What is it? Mm-hmm. The last laugh is that we talk about or the, the, what was it? Yeah. We mentioned? Yeah. Yeah. Last laugh. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Philip Brian Butler says, considering the day, what's your favorite John Lennon song? Yeah, today's the 40th anniversary of the passing of John Lennon. He said, I will be listening to it to the It's a Wonderful Life episode again soon. Yeah, definitely. Steve, do you have a favorite John Lennon song? Favorite. So, so favorite John Lennon song that man, this is a tough one. But so I, the first thing I'll say is one of the most brilliant uh, s- sentences I've ever heard in my life that I think about all the time is from, uh, which isn't my favorite song, but it's from beautiful boy. Life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Making other plans. Yeah. That's that line is like, that's when I became an adult, you know what I mean? That's when I went, Oh, I get it. You know, I was doing 30 something and all of a sudden, Oh, life is what, yeah, I get it. Um, there's so many, I mean, um, I, yeah, I, I mean, because if we go into Beatles songs, it's like, I love things yeah. like um, uh, Happiness is a Warm Gun, you yeah. know, like it's such an odd song, but it's just one that I I, I love. Um, I don't know. What about you? What are some of your uh, favorites? It's tough to pick one. I mean, imagine uh, is the... Obviously, yeah. Is the peak. So when you go from there, there's different reasons. I think Woman is a fantastic song. Mm. When you finally find the one you're supposed to be with, there is such resonance in John Lennon's songs that I didn't viscerally feel until I got together with Lindley. Like I could really mm. understand what he's talking about when he's talking about Yoko in Woman. When he's talking, when he's doing, I love the ballad of John and Yoko. That's a love that. great song. Um, Beautiful Boy is fantastic. Talking about being a dad, you know, in a way that's really touching and sentimental watching the wheels go round and round the idea of like disconnecting from the grind of having to like create and having to put stuff out there and like just taking a moment to save her life to express gratitude for what you do have and how people see that as um a weakness when it's actually a strength what, what's so interesting with him is that there's the some there's the political really intense political songs yeah there's some ang- really angry songs yeah. and some really joyful songs mm-hmm. like ballad of john and yoko and oh yoko those are uh, and beautiful mm-hmm. boy those are all really joyful um mm-hmm. i love whatever gets you through the night mm-hmm. cold turkey is a great great song you know yeah uh, I, I mean there, there's so many i even like the way i even like that song that he bashes uh paul mccartney with that song is like you want to talk about a diss track? People talk about rap diss tracks. Yeah. Why don't you listen to John Lennon's song about Paul McCartney when he was angry about the breakup? It is uh, it is a brutal song, you know. Uh, the way he goes after Paul McCartney's singles, um, mm. you know, you used to be yesterday, but now you're just another day. I mean, just like all oh, the digs are so brutal, but I mean, that's the kind of talent and brilliance of Lennon 
that if he was going to take you apart, he could take you apart with a razor sharp knife. Well, it's so funny because I read that um, uh, tune in, the, I forget the name of the mark someone, and it's that huge book on the Beatles. Mm. And it just goes, it's like a thousand pages to get to the, gets you to recording their first album, wow. you know? And, that, and so it's, it, there are three books that I, that I hope come out before these people die one is the the next two books in that series yeah uh which maybe it was like seven years ago that he did the first one and we're still waiting for the second one right. uh the other is the last of the robert caro lyndon johnson books which you know oh, he's yeah. been working on since the 70s yeah, hopefully yeah. and he's like 90 years old so hopefully he'll finish it before he dies and of course you know game of thrones if we'll ever get those books no. but uh the thing from those uh from the books about the beatles he is a a tough person. He is mean. Yep. He yep. is controlling. He is dominant. He is sarcastic. If he if he wanted to take you down a notch, man, he could do it. Yep. And it, it's so interesting that mix of uh, this peaceful guy, you know, that the image we have of the peace guy and this really angry guy, you know, and they're both the same guy. Well, and if you want, if you track the progression, and that's evolution of a human being, clearly. An incredibly gifted artist, but also one driven by a very dis a very um, demolished home life. Even though his aunt very very much tried to provide yeah. that mothering aspect to his life, there was no dad. And then that just when he's reuniting with his mom, she gets killed by a drunk driver. Uh, and so that the hole in that. And when you hear mother from the seventies that he recorded, which is in the middle of his scream therapy. Yeah time you can feel the pain of it that song is deceptively uh brilliant in its uh in how it conveys what it's like to have that hole of not having a mother a real mother in your life you know and how he how he screams about it and talk and, and sings about it in in that song it's 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 fun. It's uh, there's no way to compare the the loss of the people that were taken away from us too early, yeah. but John Lennon might be the one whose work I would have most wanted to see. Yeah, you know, I mean, yes, there's James Dean, and yes, there's oh, yeah. you know, there's a whole list of them, but John Lennon to see what he would have done next. Mm -hmm. I mean, this maybe. is why I, I cry every time when I watch Yesterday, and that scene is in there because, and by the way, I didn't know that that was Robert Carlyle. That blew my mind. Wow. Uh, it's such a great, almost John Lennon, and that line he has when he says, "Like you know, oh my God, you lived, you lived," and right. the way he speaks about love in that and what he discovered, you know, yeah, the angry young guy finally through all the hell he put people through and put himself through, finally found the one woman who understood him and broken of all those patterns step by step piece by piece to the point where he started to embrace peace he started to embrace the ability to speak about love in such an open and honest and beautiful way and a lot of his songs on double fantasy are all about that you know embracing that's why the tragedy is so yeah. powerful because he was on the precipice of exploring an entirely new age uh, as an artist of open expression of emotion and feelings and who knows what brilliance we were robbed of, Steve. Songs that could have nursed so many of us through dark nights that we weren't able to get because he was taken from us by that uh, Absolutely. killer. What, what, one thing is, uh, his death, I probably would have happened anyway, but his death is what made me a Beatles fan. Because I, you know, you know, you and I grew up in the same era. I heard Beatles songs. Sure, sure. But when he died, my sister bought all the albums and she oh, started wow. playing them. And so, you know, I'm in junior high, and that's when they and I can just remember getting sucked in. Yeah. And then I started just listening to those albums over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, we got some on these. Uh Jay Curdy sent another one. He said, Are there films you suspect could stretch to become a four-part series on the podcast? <laughs> Funny you ask. <laughs> if I recall, the most you've done is three for Black Panther and Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah. Um, Steve. <laughs> I I mean, Lawrence was three. Yes. I I I suspect it's very possible had we done Lawrence today, it might have been four. Yes. Um, I, I you know, there are I, I, it would surprise me, except that I didn't think Black Panther was going to be three episodes. And, and here's here's one of the things too. 
the more guests we have on the show, the longer the episode. You yes. know? <laughs> so if we have four guests, if we have two guests mm -hmm. for a thing and we were to do a big, big movie, you know, yeah. it's, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think we've talked about the possibility of a four part episode down the road as these, uh, as we tackle these epics or maybe tackle a certain mob epic that might be coming up from us. We shall but see. I don't, but I don't think, I think if we were to go the mobster route, there would certainly be many episodes, but I don't know if an individual movie would get four, well, it's but it's possible. Point. Famous last words. Yeah. Uh, uh, Doug Developer says, Hi, hey, John and Steve. I loved the graduate episode. I hope it's okay if I ask Steve, the director, the, if I ask Steve, the director, what factors into a best director Oscar? I see the film and don't think amazing direction. Nichols beat Norman Jewison for In the Heat of the Night um, that year. So, yeah. Do you think, well, hey, do you think that, is a legitimate victory. Like, do you think that was the right choice or, and what do you think goes into a best director Oscar, Steve? Uh, uh, you might disagree with me, but I 100% think that's the right choice. I think okay. Nichols deserves it. I know you love in, he in the heat of the I night. Do. I love it too. But in terms of direction, in terms of groundbreaking technique, uh, in the heat of the night is fairly straightforward. It's a daring movie and a really profound one, and it's done beautifully, and the performances are great. Yeah. Um, and it actually leads, I think, to a lot of 70s filmmaking. Yeah. But the way that the the artistry and the way that The Graduate is put together is really unique. It's yeah. it's very, very different. Um, I think I, it's – I'm not going to say it's a bullshit award, but it's, uh, it's so hard. Like, we see these things where the best picture doesn't get best director, and that's an example of it. And it's like, well – what are you saying? You know, uh, I, I, it's a very, and I, there's several examples of where that director didn't get the best picture, didn't get it. And it's always like, well, what, what's, what does that mean? And I don't know if I understand it. You know, I, you know when I was younger, I used to revere the Oscars in a way that was, you yeah. know, you know, like on the mountaintop, it was Olympus to me to get an Oscar, to win an Oscar. Certainly there were times in my life where I'd consider the possibility of trying to work my ass off to win an Oscar. But as oh, yeah. I get older, you embrace this, something that Scott said, something I have, I've kind of discovered on my own organically a few years ago, this idea of the subjective nature of art. If art is subjective there, then in, then therefore, or inherently the awards that are giving for art are subjective as well. And if they are subjective, then they are not the final decision or the end all be all or the untouchable conversation or untouchable uh, uh, decision about a film or the final statement about a film. So just because a film won best picture does not necessarily mean it is the best picture. Just because a director won best director, it does not necessarily mean they are the best director that year. It does for that award, but it does not mean they are the best director necessarily. No questions asked. Um, and yes, I do disagree with you. I do think In the Heat of the Night was a more difficult film to put forth, but that does not take away from what Mike Nichols did in The Graduate, which could initially be, you know, like kind of a distant film if you don't give a shit about the travails of rich people, but there's more going on uh, when the film, if you give it a chance to work on you and give it a chance to understand what's what it actually symbolizes, which we discovered uh, doing doing the show and both of these films, uh, doing the episodes for both of yeah. these films. So, yeah. I, it, it's a weird thing. I mean, like, I think particularly now the Oscars, I mean, I think this last year we had a whole bunch of great movies, but yeah. frequently, the because what it used to be is that the biggest movies of the year were great films. Yes. Yeah. And that's not now the biggest, I'm not saying that comic book movies and science fiction movies aren't great films, yeah. but you know, gone with the wind, which isn't neither your nor my favorite film. Right. Was the most, arguably it is still the most successful film of all time. Yeah. You know, the, the, you know, bridge on the river Kwai was a hugely successful film. Lawrence Ruby, hugely successful film. Yep. And those are the films going for best picture. It's very rare today that any of the top, five box office movies of the year are going for best picture. Yeah. And, and so you have this weird split in the industry and how we look at these things. And for, I mean, we can certainly point out a bunch of movies that didn't deserve to win best picture, yeah. but I think even more so it's what you say. It's like, well, this is just a subjective thing, you know, yeah. like it, it, and it's very political too. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that's one of the reasons why Jewison 
did win because it was a film that highlighted a you know yeah. civil rights thing at the time and maybe some of the academy wasn't keen on uh, dec on giving the award to norma jewison for that but that doesn't mean that was legitimately the reason doesn't mean you we don't have no way of quantifying that unless well, we interview every single person who well it, yeah. yeah well in that year in particular because i know we talked about we talked about both film that yeah. is a critical watershed year in the history yep. of film yep. because it is the year where the split between old Hollywood and new Hollywood happens. Yep. And there's a really good book called Pictures at a Revolution, which is about the five Oscar nominees for Best Picture of that year, which are uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, Bonnie and Clyde, The Graduate, In the Heat of the Night, and Dr. Doolittle. And Dr. Doolittle is <laughs> clearly just a bribe. Like it was clearly yeah. like that, you know, that the big money forced that movie in there. And you have the two old Hollywood movies, Dr. Doolittle and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. You yeah. have the two new Hollywood movies, Bonnie and Clyde and The Graduate. And that in the heat of the night sits in the middle, you know, yeah. and it sort of is both new Hollywood and old Hollywood. And, and I think that's part of the reason it wins. Yeah, you know, is that graduate and Bonnie and Clyde are too weird and too difficult for a lot of the mainstream at that time. You yeah, know? yeah. There's a new book out called The Big Goodbye about Chinatown that I definitely want to pick up as well. From uh, uh, it's called The Big Goodbye from Sam Wasson. Uh, it came out earlier this year, and I, I want to get that as a companion piece to uh, the the book you just mentioned, Pictures at a Revolution, which is fantastic if you haven't seen those or read those rather. So yeah. uh, let's see. Wayne Edwards says, uh, hello, Stephen John. I just got in. I'm going to try to get on a chat with you guys. Question. One of my favorite movie experiences was seeing Seven. Yeah, mine too. In a packed movie theater, we all walked out disturbed to a degree. Any plans to do it soon? Well, uh, I think it's at the 10 year mark by and then some. Oh, yeah. But Steve and I, but as you know in the documentary, that is one of the seminal uh, films for me in my life. So I imagine we will tackle it probably yeah. next year uh, for sure and uh, you know, kind of explore it as deeply as we possibly can. Um, yeah. All right. Let's bring on Wayne Edwards, actually, who just he's sitting here already. So there we go. All right, Wayne, you got on. What's going on, my man? All right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Hey, Wayne. Hey, Steve. Hey, John. Great to see you guys. Let me take you off too, my uh, glasses here. I've um, been following you guys ever since you started your podcast. I found the podcast. I told you, John, a while ago once when I was on this uh, Outlaw Nation show. Yeah. You mentioned it on Collider. I said, oh, let me go check it out. I've been following you guys ever since. Love you guys. Uh, Fridays, I call it Cinephile Fridays. I can't wait to see <laughs> Thank what you, you guys are going are gonna to have. Also, my main gig, I work for a, a, a delivery company. Can't say their name, but it starts with F, ends with X. Okay. And uh, when I really need to focus and there's a time crunch and I really need to get things going, I don't listen to music or do YouTube. I listen to a podcast that's going to engage my brain. And nine times out of ten, it's you guys. Wow. And I really do appreciate it. Especially here. You're welcome. Especially Apocalypse Now. I love that episode. That's <laughs> my favorite episode you guys have done that's my second favorite movie uh ever in life what, so what's your first uh 12 angry men oh wow I love that too nice. yeah yeah that, i love the episode too you guys hit a lot of a lot of points i really enjoyed and i like 12 angry men because i can watch it uh at any time it's better every time and i grow more as a person and uh yeah. You, you guys made a good point at the end of that episode saying, well, watch it differently. You may think you're Henry Fonda, but the reality is you may not be. You may be some other yeah. character, and that's so true. It's like, I may not be this idealistic, amazing person that Henry Fonda is. I may be someone else. And it's, it's great for self-examination. So, but There's so many episodes I enjoy. Jaws, Crimes and Misdemeanors, which I was shocked it was so deep for me. Rocky, so many. That's, but I love Crimes, you guys. And Crimes and Misdemeanors is one of I've re-listened to that one. Yeah, I, I, that's one of my favorites. I've just I, that was really personal. Like it got into some oh. some stuff, you know, for me. Yeah, yeah. for me for I, sure. I, I want to say some. I'm surprised, Steve. Here's a little peek behind the curtain for Wayne and everybody else who's watching. That Jaws episode was a was a bit of a monster for us to do. Yes, uh, because you know we uh, Eric, I don't think had understood what the show was, and then really? I had. I had been working late 
Uh, and I was, super I was wondering tired. if you going to say this. Now I'm going to spoil this. I'm absolutely. Gonna, I fell asleep twice while we were doing the episode on the mic, <laughs> on the mic, because I was so fucking tired from having. Wow. Done, I was still building up my endurance of doing multiple shows at once. And I love Jaws, but there was something about the way we were doing it that kind of slowed my brain down. I was so comfortable with Steve and Eric that I just kind of nodded off a couple of times and then caught myself and tried to try to catch up at the speed and fool them that I hadn't passed the fall of fell asleep. <laughs> uh, and look, my girlfriend will tell you this too. My girlfriend hates it because when I cuddle up to my girlfriend, I fall asleep like this. When I don't oh, cuddle wow. up, I stay awake for like an hour. So it drives her nuts because she wants to stay awake with me cuddling. But when we get so glad, I just pass out. So it's when I'm comfortable with people that I can really kind of let my guard down and fall asleep. And that night, it was terrible. We were in my house on my couches. So it, I just, it, I, it, was, it was so funny. I, 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 was, I didn't know if you were going to bring this up. Oh. It was so funny because, uh, you know, I kind of do the play-by-play. And then I stop, you know, and I go – with the expectation that someone else is going to jump in and, and Eric would go there was, and both John and Eric said amazing things and they said great stuff. And I think it's a good podcast, yeah. but there were moments it's where I go and, th and, and then this happens and Eric would go, yeah. And then I looked over at John and John was not saying anything. Yeah. And I was like, what's, Oh, I guess I have to keep talking. <laughs> you know? And then and, and we didn't, I think we recorded it like, <laughs> two months before we put it out yeah. because I just didn't want to face editing it. And then once oh. I edited it and then, you know, and then, it, you know, because you take out the boring parts. So like, because yeah. <laughs> what, what, what everyone said was great. It was just, there were parts where there was just nothing going on. <laughs> um, Plus you guys had the, the fancy libations that uh, uh, the other guests brought. You guys oh, brought right. some. Uh, oh, that's true. Right. Yeah. We're, we're, and cool. no ice. And I remember you guys had no ice for that. that was, it's that really terrible. No ice. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey guys, thank you so much. I could keep talking, but uh, congratulations! I saw the the 200th episode uh, movie. That was awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank Good you. job, guys. I'm really proud thank of you. Thank you so much, man. Have a great one. You're the best. Good to see you, Wayne. Awesome stuff. All right, Steve. We got. I think we got to let you go. Right? You got to roll on out of here. Yeah, I could do. I see. There's one more question yeah. popped up. So okay. All right, CP3 Diddy. What's up, dude? Hey, John, how you doing? Steve, I don't think I've ever had the pleasure of meeting you. Hello, how you doing, sir? Very nice to meet you. Very nice, likewise. Uh, my question today, John, you know that I uh, just had a baby recently. And uh, well, my question my question is, uh, thank you so much, man. Um, named him after my Lord and Savior, Christian. Not Harlow, <laughs> fail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nickname CJ. Uh, yeah. I tell you what, man, I was, I, I was nervous like when she told me I had the echo. Hey, I'm pregnant, pregnant, pregnant. I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And just being a, being a brand new dad, it's so easy. Uh, just picking up on the things of uh, you know what what needs to be done and and what sh what you should do. You just go ahead and do it. I was just I didn't think I was gonna fall into that role that uh, yeah. that easily. So my question for you, and this could be literally any any story ever. Uh, what's your favorite um, character or just or just story in general where you have somebody that has to have a, a huge challenge and they overcome everything to get that challenge done. Top of my head, I just looked up, I just looked at the back of my movie list is one of them is my, one of my favorite movies, Casino Royale, of just James Bond being a cocky, cocky, you know, brand new double O agent at the end when he gets the, when he gets the, uh, the music, when he gets to say, I'm Bond, James Bond, you know, he finally becomes what he needs to be. And I forget his, I forget his, his name, but the actor who plays Goldfield oh, in oh, 1917, God. where it's just yeah. like he was picked out. The dude who was uh, picked out originally, he dies. Spoiler, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the uh, Schofield just has to do uh, to, to the end. He could have just, you know, mm. that scene with that French girl. He could have just stayed there, and he he was like, I gotta go on, I gotta do it. So yeah, that's my question. What's what's your favorite like character arc that has to get the deed done no matter what? Hmm. Uh, the number one that pops to my mind, Die Hard. You can't beat Die Hard. Like, you know. Best Christmas movie ever. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, th I, there's one that I'm trying to think of that's like not in the action realm. Okay. That's a different one. And I can't, there's, that's just falling out of my brain. I can like, it's like I think, my tongue. Well, I think for me, to give you time to think here, I think Ben Hur is my choice because. Oh, that's a great choice. Got to get back to his family. 
He has got yeah. to restore his family's credibility or his family's um, nobility in some way and absolve them of this frame job by Masala. And he mm-hmm. endures so much, even questioning himself, questioning if it's going to happen, questioning his faith, questioning his God. And mm-hmm. then, But he does end up arriving where he needs to be, and he does end up restoring his family's dignity and absolving them of that crime. And his family is healed by the death of Jesus Christ. So it's like that is that for me is a very powerful. Sure. He overcomes and so having much. one of the best scenes in all in Semino. Yeah. The chariot scene. Oh, yeah. Agreed. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, all right. CP3, uh, PD, thanks for coming in, brother. Man, appreciate the question. Absolutely. Absolutely, Plus guys. Love. Have a good one. You too. Much love. All right, one and, last one, Steve. I know you got to go. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Keith uh, Fotheringham says, Hi, John and Steve. You two are entertaining and super knowledgeable. By far the best podcast in the entire online movie sphere. That's very kind. Thank you. Have, have you seen Kiss Me Deadly? Love Robert Aldrich and Ralph Meeker. Would love to hear you do that. I've never seen it. I know what it is, but I've never seen it. Yeah. You? Yeah, I have not seen it either. Would love to do it. I know it's a Criterion film, so already in my mind, I know it has quality. So uh, I, I will absolutely, uh, that's something we could definitely take a look at down the road. We've talked about doing older films for sure. So that's certainly. Well, and I think we've never done a movie. We've done movies that I had never seen that you had seen and movies yeah. you had never seen that I've seen. Yeah. We've never, as far as I know, done a movie that neither of us had seen. That's true. That's a fair point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just picked up Failsafe uh, in case we end up doing that one down the road too. Someone put a request in that for, for that one recently I saw. Yeah. yeah. I saw it, I think a long time ago, but I don't have much memory of it. Okay, well, yeah. maybe. Uh, can I ask you one last one, Steve, and then we'll roll? Sure. Uh, with the rise in affordable video equipment, this is from Buckeye Jack, and easy access to YouTube to showcase work, do you ever see a time when expensive four-year film schools become extinct and weeks-long crash courses taking its place? NYU can cost over 200 grand these days. Jesus Christ, is that true? God damn. Do you ever see that, Steve? Um, I have complicated feelings about this. When uh, When I went to film school, it was... I thought really expensive. It's not expensive now. Mm. And when I got out of film school, I was pretty angry mm. about it. I, I, because like if, if I went to USC, which is arguably one of the best film schools in the country, yep. if I had gone to Harvard law school, there would have been people recruiting me out of Harvard law school to go to, you know, clerk on the Supreme court yeah, or yeah. like a $150,000 job as a junior partner or whatever. You know, if I went to the top business school, same thing, go to the top film school, then nobody. And the, you know, I went my class at USC, my semester, about 50 students, maybe eight or nine of them are working in the film industry now. Wow. You know, and so the, I felt really angry and ripped off. Um, and, and, and I was like, look, if you, and at the time I was kind of going, instead of spending your hundred thousand dollars or whatever on film school move to LA, get a job as a PA and put that money towards making a movie. Yeah. Um, that was my opinion then. Then I ended up teaching film school. <laughs> so talk about, you know, hypocrisy. Um, and I saw really good education happening. So I'm kind of of two minds about it. Yeah. I think there are things, I think there's no substitute for practical experience. I also think there are things you can learn in film school that you can't learn elsewhere, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of how to approach it. Um, and I think it kind of depends on your personality. But yep. as an investment in your future, it is a shitty investment. Yep. Like in terms of money in to get money out. Yeah, wouldn't do it. It's a hell of a chance to take on your career. Absolutely. And I think there are now with the at, with the explosion of film commentary and criticism, there are ways for you to approach how to direct a movie, how to do all these things to learn at least the bones of it. But as Steve said, the practical practical. Uh, experience of being on the set and also the experience of pitching the experience of creating of writing working with people all of that can't be taught uh, you have to experience it and learn that it's like you gotta learn that from a youtube video and that's always going to make the difference because you're making films with your classmates in the film school and dealing with personalities oh that yeah rub you the wrong way and you've got to learn to navigate that to get the overall goal of the film made so yeah well and and, and i'll say this just one thing too Basically, every student that would show up in my class, and this was true when I went to film school. Yeah. What do you want to do? What do you want to be? And they're like, I want to be a writer director. Well, a writer, almost no one is suited to that job. Yeah. In my experience of having taught hundreds and hundreds of students, maybe I had four 
that I really thought could be a writer director. Some could be a writer, some could be an editor, some could run camera. So, you know, there are people that can do different skills, but it's really clear that that job is not for most people. And you could, and, 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 and sorry, I know I'm going on, but, but yeah, no, it's okay. you know, when I said I had to get off, I know, but, you know but, but uh, you know, you can't shut me up at a certain <laughs> point. Um, well, the, one of the things I was thinking is you went, I want to be a mathematician. Well, you've done math all through school. Yeah. You know what doing math is like. You love math. People who say, I want to be a director, they love movies. And maybe they see movie stars and people that are rich and famous. And they go, I want to be rich and famous. And I love movies. Those things have nothing to do with making movies. Yeah, Making movies is a, is a, is a extremely... A uh, complicated, highly organized, bureaucratic, you know, plan ahead out in the rain at three in the morning, shooting things. It's heavy lifting. It's all, it's nothing to do with the romance and the, the loveliness and, you know, fantasy of movies. It's different. And so, you know, you're in for a real rude awakening. So at the very least, I'd say make some movies first. Yeah. You know, listen to the cinephiles, <laughs> learn about film. And then if you really think you, this is for you, then think about film school i think that's a great way to put it uh all right steve thanks so much we'll let you go i appreciate you taking the time brother man to stop in and fantastic work on the documentary thanks. it's a, you know it's a joy to do the show with you and it's a it's a joy to see the joy being expressed in the documentary from so many people who've been uh honored to be our guests and we've been blessed to have and so many of the fans who've been honored to listen to us and we've been blessed to have on uh with us um any final words or uh you rolling out of here well, first of all, right back at you and a joy to do the show with you. And, you know, I learned so much from you over the years of doing this. And certainly it's, you know, it, I, it's wonderful to see that the work is appreciated. So, and I thank you very much for doing this screening, for coming, bringing me on for the q and I, re I really do appreciate it. Absolutely. You can follow Steve at SR Morris on Twitter and at SR Morris one on Instagram. And of course, every Friday you can listen to us do the cinephiles we're doing Part two dropping this Friday of The Untouchables. Yep. Uh, and uh, if you want to uh, you know, go through all the entire catalog, go find The Cinephiles wherever you download podcasts and enjoy that. And go to our YouTube channel. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're starting to look at doing more live streams, more content for the YouTube channel to increase uh, that uh, um, connection with the audience as well. So, uh, all right. Much love, brother, man. Give my best to Thank Karen you. and Jackson. I'll see you soon. All right. Bye. All right, bye. All right, that was Steve Morris, ladies and gentlemen, to, uh, taking some time to hang out with us tonight on the Outlaw Nation show. He's been a guest on the Outlaw Nation show before, so excited to have him back. My my glass is hurting my face now, so I'm taking them off. Thanks for hanging out with me tonight. Really appreciate you all taking the time. Thanks for all the likes. Thanks for the comments. Thanks for the streamlabs and super chats. Much appreciated. Hope there was maybe more than Sean Barrett, so maybe there's a couple more of you who uh, had to kind of heard about the cinephiles, heard me mention the cinephiles, Maybe tonight you took a chance and watched the documentary and now maybe you're in and you're going to go back and explore some of these episodes that we've done on the show and uh, become a fan and become maybe even a patron of what we do uh, here on The Cinephile. So, um, all right, thanks to Sean for producing the show. Thanks to everybody for coming by and stopping by. Really appreciate all the comments, all the love. Thanks to everybody who's a part of that Cinephile's documentary. You guys mean the world to me, and it's been an honor to do it. Um, and at this point, I'm going to take the hell off because i got to rest a little bit before I jump on and do Cinema Bias with uh, uh, Video Drew and uh, Alex Shawshank, I think, on Video Drew's channel. Uh, Sean will be a part of that as well, so I can't get rid of him since that SOB. I can't get rid of him, but he, he'll be a part of it as well. Uh, but I love him to pieces. Uh, all right, that's it for me. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate everything. Please give this video a like. Please leave a comment. Please share it. I know now. I know times are tough financially for so many people, especially during the Christmas season. So anything you can give that you've given so far i appreciate it. if you want to be part of the outlaw nation patreon it's right there patreon.com slash john roca go get on that as well we do two hangouts a week started to do more with the patrons as well kind of uh, brainstorming more to do with the patrons. so i spend more of my time uh you know with the patrons creating stuff for the patrons talking with the patrons that's certainly the way we're going to be going so if you you know if you want to have more conversations about film about life about whatever the patreon is the way to get extra exposure about that extra conversations about that our hangouts have been stellar over the last few months and it's been a great time every single time i've hung out with uh, with them and, and talk with them and sometimes you get to even influence what we do on the outlaw nation channel so it just depends on the conversation get go get involved there and if you can't donate which i totally 
understand and respect and 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 you know sympathize and totally love uh you for even feeling guilty about it please like the show share the show with your friends and family that's important that's just as valuable as any contribution you can give because we want to keep growing the outlaw nation you know we're at 14,000 500 or 14,600. We're trying to get to 15,000 and beyond. So please keep sharing the show. Keep talking to people about everything we do here on the Outlaw Nation channel and bring in new guests, new eyes, uh, new people to take a chance on us. That means the world to me as well. All right. That's it uh, for everybody. Thanks to everybody. And I'll end the show like I end every show. Please, I know this is the holiday season. It's Christmas. This is the toughest time sometimes for a lot of ple- people. Please, whatever you need to do to get through the next second, next minute, next hour, next day, next week, next month, next year, I'd like you to find your way to do that because I want you with us. I want you as we grow this nation. You are an important part of the outlaw nation. You mean so much to me to be part of this nation, and I want you around to see what we can do with this thing. A year from now, where are we going to be? And I want you here with me a year from now to see what we've done and how we've grown and how we've expanded and knowing that you were an important part of it. So thank you all so much for being part of the Outlaw Nation, and let's keep on going. And I'll see you next week with another live episode of the Outlaw Nation show. Much love to everybody, and uh, let me play the video, and we're out of here. All right? Take care of yourselves. Be well. Wear your mask. Practice social distancing. Don't let anyone intimidate you to put yourself in a dangerous situation with this COVID stuff as well, please. All right? All right. Much love. Peace.